Hello. Hello. And we'll give it a few more minutes. Folks are still hopping on. Welcome everyone. We're giving it just a few more moments um, to get everyone to join in. But uh, on chat, if you guys see it in the Zoom chat, we're asking folks to get settled in. Please share a favorite pun or where you're joining from today. Catherine, we've got close to 200, so I think whenever you're ready. All right, thank you. I see some great puns in the chat. So if you have not had the chance, go check them out. All right, I think we can go ahead and start the recording. Awesome, all right. So good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our island partners in Hawaii, Guam, Saipan, and American Samoa. I know it's probably early for you guys, but we are so happy that you can join us. So brief introduction on my end. My name is Catherine Del Mundo and I am calling in from Parker, Colorado. I am the retail food specialist for Arizona and the temporary specialist for California, filling in for the wonderful Captain Diane Kelch. So I will be the moderator for our Pacific breakout session today. And just a quick housekeeping, you can navigate to our Pacific breakout page to join the meeting. So when you join, you should be jumping into the Zoom app itself. Um, so if you have any questions or comments throughout our session today, please use the chat in Zoom and that will help facilitators capture them. Now, because we are in Zoom, please make sure that you are muted so as not to interrupt the speakers that we have planned for today. Now, joining us and calling in all the way from my beautiful island home of Guam is the very dedicated Mr. David Engelskirchen. So David is the FDA Retail Food Specialist for American Samoa, CNMI, Guam, Nevada, and Washington. And even with the time difference, I think he mentioned on chat that it is 5.30 in the morning. He is still joining our breakout. That's why we dubbed him as dedicated. And he will be monitoring the chat and helping out the facilitators for the presentations that we have today. So again, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom chat and David will make sure they are captured. Now, to start us off, I'd like to call on our esteemed and admirable branch director, Mr. Christopher Smith, who's calling in from Atlanta, Georgia, to start us off and do the welcome remarks and provide the OSCP retail updates. So Chris, I will kick it over to you and I will have your presentation pulled up in just a second.
Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Let me make sure I can. Okay, ready to go. Welcome to the Pacific Breakout Session of the FDA Retail Food Protection Seminar. I am so happy that you're able to join us today. We have an exciting and educational agenda ready for you. Um, as some of you know, I'm actually on special assignment to another part of the agency where I've been for a couple months now. So I have, this makes it even more special for me to come back and to, to give this presentation with you today, to see the specialists who I work with on a regular basis. Yeah, and to share this information with you. So I'm gonna give you some updates today. We'll take about 10, 15 minutes doing that. And then we'll go through some program standards recognition yeah, from the last year. So for the last two and a half years, it obviously it's been very, very difficult for all of us to suffer through the pandemic and all of the changes to our world that came with it. Despite that, the work of public health and retail food safety has gone on. We've risen to the challenge, we've adapted, we've improved. I'm very, very proud of the work that we've all done together. And I'm, I'm really happy to share these updates from our office with, a, with you all today. There it is. All right. So let's start with some congratulations. The list you see on the screen here are the new standardizations that have been completed within the last year. So I wanted to start by recognizing these new standardized food safety inspections, inspection officers. Those listed on this slide have completed all field standardization requirements with one of our retail food specialists since the last summer. It's a significant accomplishment that reflects expertise and food code knowledge and application, as well as a demonstration of communication skills and the use of risk-based inspection techniques. This is a huge accomplishment. Yeah, and every one of you should be very proud of this. Larry, Mike, Clark, Emma, Dan, Amber, Susan, Christina, and Heidi. Congratulations to our new standardization officers as well as to everybody who's been re-standardized as well within the last year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be doing some additional recognitions on program standards accomplishments after I finish with these updates. Next, I wanted to remind everybody about our retail flexible funding model portal that is currently open until October 12th. I encourage everyone eligible to take advantage of this opportunity to participate and improve your programs. Our retail food specialists are here to support you and your work in the retail program standards. The National Environmental Health Association, NEHA, is the administrator of this funding program, and they stand ready to assist you with any questions related to it. Next, I wanted to mention our the NEHA Retail Food Safety Regulatory Training Needs Assessment, which is also part of the Retail Flexible Funding Model. This is an objective to conduct a nationwide state, local, tribal, territorial training needs assessment. All responses to this are anonymous. You can find a link to this on NEHA's website, on the Association Collaborative website. I think you can find it on this website for this seminar. Yeah, it's really important. We're trying to get as many responses to this as we can. This is for our retail regulatory officials. The survey findings will be evaluated and shared with association and regulatory partners to bolster our educational resources, to reduce the knowledge gaps in the profession, and to improve workforce capability. Please, please take advantage of this and participate in this survey. Next, hopefully you're all aware, but if you're not, I wanted to make you aware that our program standards have recently been released for 2022. 
So this just happened on August 24th, so not even a month ago. It included some significant changes in standards such as standard two, standard six, standard eight. I encourage you to take a look at these, to be make yourself comfortable with them. Please feel free to reach out to your retail food specialist with any questions about them. These updates reflect the recommendations made from the 2021 Biennial Conference for Food Protection meeting. So you can find a summary of changes for these standards and the standards themselves on our website, fda.gov slash retail food protection. You see the longer link there in the slide. Next, just a reminder about the risk factor study workshop that will be held this Thursday yeah, after our seminar ends. Yeah, and you see the schedule up on the screen. Very excited about this. Encourage everyone to attend. As our division director, Andre Pierce, mentioned yesterday, conducting a risk factor study in your jurisdiction is the best way to get data, to assess the current state of your program, and to help target intervention strategies to improve. And of course, this is all part of standard nine of the retail program standard. So I'm going to be there. I hope to see all of you there. Speaking of the program standards, I'm also very happy to announce that there are going to be several options to take the self-assessment and verification audit workshops in the coming year. These include two virtual instructor-led options. They also include two face-to-face -face options in conjunction with the AFTO and the NEHA annual educational conferences. And finally, we've added a series of online self-directed courses. So those are courses that are asynchronous courses where you can go in or self-paced. You just take them whenever you want. The information you'll get from all of these course options is the same, you know, but we wanted to provide you as many different distinct courses as well as learning methods as possible to meet the need for anyone who would like to attend. We want you to have the information, however, is the best way for you to receive it. So please take advantage of this, learn about the standards, you know, use, you know, whether you've taken these courses previously or not, it's always good to get a refresher. They're open, yeah, for those who need them. Other happenings in 2023, wanted to make you aware. The next Conference for Food Protection will be held face-to-face -face in Houston next April. This, of course, is the forum where food code and program standards changes are discussed and debated amongst our retail stakeholders. All are encouraged to attend. And you can find information on that at foodprotect.org. In addition, I'm pleased to announce that the FDA Retail Food Seminars will return to a face-to-face -face format in 2023. I am so excited about seeing all of you at the Conference for Food Protection or the seminar, wherever. Yeah, it's just gonna be great to interact with everybody face-to-face -face again. After three years of doing this meeting virtually, just can't wait for that. Details are still being worked out, but we are planning to have several seminars across the country as we have in the past. Yeah, it will look a little bit di different, but we are gonna have some geographic spread on seminars. Yeah provide as many options for attendance as possible. So more information will be forthcoming on that. And finally, as part of this presentation, I wanted to mention our new era of smarter food safety, which is our blueprint for the future in the FDA food program. This blueprint is our strategic plan. It's a 10 year strategic plan for our FDA food program. So it encompasses everything in our food program, retail as well as manufactured foods. You know, honest, our strategic initiative that spans 10 years, it's been going on for two years. So we have eight years to go. And it looks to the future to address the food safety challenges of the 21st century and beyond. 
On this slide, you see the four pillars or core elements outlined in the blueprint, each of which is critical to bending the curve of foodborne illness. Tech enabled traceability, smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response, new business models and retail modernization, and food safety culture. In thinking about the challenges and the opportunities over the next decade, FDA leadership, after getting feedback from stakeholders such as all of you, identified these as the foundational pillars of the new era of smarter food safety, covering a range of technologies, analytics, business models, modernization, and values as its building blocks. There's a lot of synergy amongst these core elements. An idea in one element may be relevant to one or more of the others. I'm gonna focus these next few slides on new business models and retail modernization, but encourage you to take a look at the New Era website. So you can easily find it, just Google New Era of Smarter Food Safety, take a look at the blueprint. Feel free to reach out with any questions you have about it. So as I mentioned, going to focus a little bit on core element three specifically, which is new business models and retail modernization. That includes two pieces, ensuring safety of food produced or delivered using new business models and modernization of traditional re retail food safety approaches. So the first one, ensuring safety of food produced or delivered using new business models. Yeah, if you look at the statistic over there on the right, the online share of grocery shopping and retail versus online grocery shopping, you see the 80-20 split there and the expected growth by 2023 to $100 billion annually. Yeah, these statistics I'm pretty sure came from before the pandemic. I would wager it's probably a much higher percentage of online sales now. Yeah, and we're going to continue to see that grow. Yeah, in the pandemic, a lot more people experimented with online shopping, with third-party delivery services than ever before, things like meal kit delivery services. Yeah, this is a large and growing segment. Yeah, and I can tell you, I took advantage of it myself during the pandemic and experimented with some of these things, used meal kit services for the first time ever. Yeah, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Yeah, so this part of the core element is meant to take a look at that, to study that, to learn about it, to improve what we're doing there. So we started by holding a new business model e-commerce summit last October, which was attended by over 2,800 individuals and over 44 countries were represent, represented. Some of the common themes we heard out of that were questions about the regulatory landscape, concern about risk, wanting more education and outreach on these issues. So that's what we've been working on here in the last year, assessing the next steps and determining how, whether or how FDA regulations that we have in place right now apply to specific e-commerce activities. We're gonna to continue to work on that. We're partnering with the Conference for Food Protection and USDA to promote the CFP guidance on this topic, consumer and third-party delivery services. Um, we're partnering with stakeholders on education and communication around that. You're going to see more outreach, more education on this topic in the months ahead. And we're also trying to learn more about labeling in the online grocery shopping experience. So there's still a lot to do here. We're just learning about it. We're still at the beginning stages of it, but you're going to hear a lot more about this moving forward. As far as Retail modernization goes. I hope my slide's going to move soon. As far as retail modernization goes, I've hit. Sorry about that. There's several things we're doing in this space. The first is creating a structure to assess the effectiveness of the retail food regulatory programs. Yeah, so one of the first things you wanna to do to, to look at the system is to do an assessment of that system, to think about what's going right, what are we doing really well here? Where are the gaps? What are the things we can do to improve what we do across the country? 
you know, that have the best public health impacts. Yeah, so we're gonna do that type of assessments, yeah, just to learn about the system and target our interventions across the board. Figure out where more resources need to go. Like I say, figure out where the gaps are, how we can improve. We're gonna incorporate, we're gonna look at improving our focus on using risk-based methodologies and root cause analysis. How can we evolve to thinking of moving the inspector from being someone looking for food code violations to someone who's more of a public health coach? And we wanna facilitate the implementation of well-developed food safety management systems throughout the industry. The results of our FDA risk factor study tell us that the facilities that have well-developed food safety management systems have fewer occurrences of foodborne illness risk factors. And of course, we wanna implement interventions that positively impact food safety behaviors and practices. That is food safety culture. So the road ahead, you see a lot of things on this slide showing listings of projects that have been worked on and we're gonna to continue to work on in the year and years ahead. Many of these were mentioned as part of the Association Collaborative and the CDC presentations yesterday. The main thing I wanna stress here is that the FDA Retail Program works in partnership with our associations, with CDC on these deliverables as part of the Association Collaborative. It's a true partnership designed to leverage resources and combine our collective expertise. We can't do it alone and we're all in this together. The objective is to work in a complementary way towards our common goal of improving retail food safety in this country. I encourage each of you to check out the Association Collaborative website, where there's a wealth of information about these projects and much more. And finally, I wanted to say thank you to NACHO and to our retail food specialists for planning this exceptional agenda, and to all of the speakers who will share information with us today. I also wanted to thank all of you for your attendance here, most importantly for your commitment to improving public health in retail food safety. All right, Catherine, I think we're ready for the next I one, have, our recognition one. I will have that up. And then we have... All right. So next, really wanted to run through some of our accomplishments for retail program standards. Yeah, in our former Pacific states over this last year, we are really proud of all of these accomplishments. I really want to take a second to commend you for all of the work that's being done. Yeah, and this recognizes, this recognizes a lot of the accomplishments, but not all of them. Yeah, the retail program standards are about continuous improvement. So there's a lot of accomplishments you know, that don't necessarily translate right away to meeting a standard. Yeah, there are things you work on little by little to make improvements in your program. Yeah, and don't diminish that. That is really important. And I want to commend all of you for making improvements within your programs by using the standards. So let's take a look at these. And get this presentation to go. So just an overview, the milestone certificates and the letters are presented to jurisdictions who have done these things, completed an initial full self-assessment of all nine standards called an SA-9, completion of a full self-assessment of periodic of all nine standards. So this is your, the first one is the initial self-assessment, but you still have to do one every every few years on all nine standards. Also meeting and reporting a successful verification audit of one or more standards during the current self-assessment cycle and meeting and reporting a successful verification audit during the current self-assessment cycle. Oops. Go back, go back, go back. Sorry about that. All right, so full self-assessment of all nine standards. So Clark County on their second cycle, you see they got the certificate there. Liberty County also on their second cycle, congratulations. 
Yakima Health District in Washington, also on their second cycle, second time around. It's sad on their third cycle. So these are done every five years. So it must be 10 years in or so there. Sierra County Health and Human Services in California, also on their third, congratulations. Cochise, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. County Health and Social Services in Arizona, they are number four, excellent. Montana Department of Health and Services also on their fourth. Washoe County, Nevada on their fourth. So congratulations to everybody who has done a full self-assessment. That is a huge accomplishment to go through all of those standards, to look at where your program is in relation to each one and to think about where your gaps are and where you want to improve as huge, huge. Standard one is regulatory foundation, basically food code adoption. Again, Cochise County Health and Social Services in Arizona, congratulations. Flathead City County Health, Montana, also standard one. Lewis and Clark County, Montana, standard one. Liberty County, again, standard one. And I see three certificates there, but they'll come up again. Montana Department of Health and Human Services. Love to see all the certificates. Pima County, standard one. Washoe again, standard one. Gosh, so many certificates and letters there. Standard two, training of your regulatory staff. So this includes your initial training of new inspectors. It includes your continuing education. It includes your standardization process. Liberty County, congratulations again on meeting standard two. Montana Department of Health and Human Services. Congratulations on standard two. County of Monterey in California, standard two. Standard three is the inspection program based on HACCP principles. Yeah, congratulations to Flathead City County Health Department on meeting standard three. Also, Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, congratulations. And Kitsap again on standard three, congratulations. And County of Monterey in California. And Seattle and King County in Washington, congratulations on meeting standard three. and Washoe County Health District. Standard four is uniform inspection program. That is basically your quality assurance program that you have built and you have assessed to make sure it is effective. Big, big accomplishments. Uh, everyone who's met standard four, which unfortunately we don't have anybody this time. So like I say, this is a big one. So yeah, this is something to continue working towards. Like I say, I know several of you have been working on this one and we, will, we are gonna get there with some in the future. Standard five, foodborne illness and food defense preparedness and response. Again, this is a big one, big accomplishment. Congratulations, Kitsap. Also congratulations, Public Health Seattle and King County. and Washoe County Health District. Congratulations. 
standard six, another big one, compliance and enforcement. I don't believe we have anybody in this one this year. Standard seven is industry and community relations. Again, Cochise, Cochise County Health and Social Services, Arizona. Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, congratulations. It's SAP again, Public Health District in Washington, congratulations. And County of Monterey, congratulations. Pima County, congratulations. And Seattle and King County again, congratulations on standard seven. Snohomish Health District in Washington, congrats on standard seven. Washoe County Health District again with all doing excellent. Congrats on standard seven as well. Standard eight is program support and resources, another very tough one to meet. And standard nine program assessment. We don't have anybody in these categories, but I know we will moving forward. Congratulations to everyone with these program standards accomplishments. Yeah, look forward, wanna make sure I spend some time every single year recognizing you and all of your hard work. Just an excellent job to everyone. Really appreciate everything you're doing to move your programs forward. And with that, I am, I am finished, Catherine. I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to the agenda. All right, thank you. That was so amazing. Great job again, everyone. It was so great to see all those beautiful smiling faces. So moving on with our agenda, I'd like to introduce the facilitator for our next session. And you all know and love her, the amazing Miss Katie Kennedy. So amazing Katie is calling in from Beaverton, Oregon, and she is the FDA retail food specialist for Alaska, Hawaii, and Oregon. So Katie, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, welcome to everybody. I hope you've been able to enjoy some of the sessions this morning from some of the other regions. I know I have. They're very good. Um, and we're excited to kick off our session of speakers this afternoon. So let me introduce our first one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ellen Shoemaker is here, and she's going to um, provide a presentation about fermented foods for the group. Dr. Shoemaker is an extension associate associate at North Carolina State University, where she directs outreach for Safe Plates, North Carolina State Extension's family of evidence-based food safety programming and resources for retail, community, and home-based food safety. She designs, implements, and evaluates food safety messages throughout the farm to fork continuum. Sounds familiar to much of what we do, huh? Uh, with her team, she also develops and provides food safety programs to food retailers, consumers, farmers markets, and other community groups. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Ellen is going to talk to us about some of the trends, challenges, and other issues associated with fermented foods. All right, thank you, Katie. I'll just confirm that you can see my slides. Great. And hear you, you're all set. Oh, great. All right, well, thank you everyone um, for attending this session. I'm glad to be here with you all today. As Katie said, I'll be talking about the food safety of fermented foods. And I am based at North Carolina State University as part of the Safe Plates team. And so as part of that, we do a variety of work in food safety research, extension, and in communication and outreach. Um, so I am the director of outreach and extension there. And so a, a big part of this is, is working with, with retailers and operators, as well as regulators. And so I'll be talking a little bit about that um, experience today as well. And so when we think about fermented foods. So we have a long history with fermented foods. And so as, as a lot of you know, they've been around for thousands of years and they really cut across a variety of cultures and traditions and we'll be touching on a lot of those today. And so there are a few things at play, a few factors that really contribute to what we think of when we um, think about a fermented food. And so it's that combination between flavor and preservation. So the fermentation process itself, it really creates the flavors in all the fermented foods that we enjoy. I know a lot of you probably have a favorite fermented food or beverage. Um, and they 
ferment, fermentation also acts to help to preserve foods. And so as they have continued to increase in popularity and really um, permeate a lot of different cultures and as people explore different types of foods, um, we've also seen an uptick in retail establishments continue to, um, to, to serve these fermented foods. And so today we're going to spend some time talking about potential food safety issues that could come up as a result of that. And something that we do as part of the Safe Plates program is that we teach a course for regulators on validation and verification of retail HACCP plans to provide an in-depth look at specialized processes. And fermentation as one of those specialized processes is something that we talk about. And so you're going to be hearing some examples from me today that we that we use in this class. And um, I hope that can provide some, some good context for you all for moving forward. So when we think first about fermentation more broadly. So what, what is fermentation? So fermentation is the controlled growth of a microorganism that produces a desired byproduct that changes the food. So that, um, that produced byproduct is, it results in a change in flavor, but also um, ultimately acts as that pre preserving agent. And so um, basically it um, acts to create, um, so during this fermentation process, there's that na native or added microorganism. So we have this, this instance where there may be naturally occurring microorganisms in the food or an added starter culture, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And through that process, they convert sugars that are in the food to acid, alcohol, and or gas, which creates that flavor profile that we associate with fermented foods, as well as acting against pathogenic and spoilage microorganisms. And so that ultimately helps inhibits other microorganisms from surviving and growing. So when we think about fermentation at retail, most fermentation is a result of lactic acid bacteria. And so lactic acid bacteria, that includes a number of different types of bacteria. So it includes lactobacillus, leuconostoc, pediococcus, lactococcus, and streptococcus. And so this group, as the name suggests, they're defined by the fact that they produce lactic acid. And so this lactic acid production then interferes with pathogen growth. And it also acts with other byproducts of the lactic acid production process um, to contribute to the flavor. And so there are many common retail fermentations that, that we see and that you all have had probably had experiences with. And in terms of coming up with following along with these specialized processes and developing HACCP plans, this really allows operators to do the processes that gives them a desired end product that really meets their, their goal, as well as to reduce risk, increase quality, and really meet their goal of what they want to be serving to their, to their clients. And so we have several different types of retail fermentations. There's, there's the dairy fermentations of such as yogurt and cream fresh. We'll be talking a little bit about yogurt today. There are a variety of plant fermentations that you are all probably familiar with. Sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, stinky tofu, vinegars. There are, are meat fermentations such as sausages and salami. And there are beverage fermentations such as kombucha, but of course there's also wine and, and um, other types of alcohol. Um, and so those are some of the more common ones that we're seeing at retail today. So when we think about, and now that we have talked about what fermentation actually is and how those microorganisms are being um, influenced in their growth, if we take a step back and think about food safety a little bit more broadly, so we know there are several factors that, that influence um, microorganism growth, and in turn, there are steps that we can take to impact those factors to really limit microorganism growth if we're trying to limit the growth of pathogens, um, because that's that's a lot, of, a lot of what we do, right? And so food safety is all about reducing the presence and growth of potential pathogens that can cause foodborne illness. And there are several factors at play. Um, we'll, we'll be mostly focusing on acidity today, but other major factors include time, temperature, usually those are, are working together, as well as oxygen and moisture. And so um, if these factors are manipulated properly, they can really create an environment that is not going to be um, feasible for a pathogen to, to grow well, that would to, to ultimately reduce um, foodborne illness. And so um, 
the parameters of the food code that, that you all are familiar with, as well as the specialized processes that happen outside of the food code, they're built around these factors as well to really control for, for pathogenic microorganisms. So just as an example, um, a lot of us use, use the term TCS food. So it's that time and temperature control for food safety. Um, so those are foods in which two of the factors, time and temperature need to be controlled to reduce pathogenic growth. But if a food is non-TCS, that means that the growth is being controlled by one of the other three factors, such as acidity, oxygen, and moisture. And so when we think about fermentation, that is um, the factor that's being controlled here is the reduction in pH. So ultimately we're using microorganisms to reduce the pH of the product and um, cutting back on the growth, potential growth of, of pathogens. So when we think about acidity, I know you all are, are probably somewhat familiar with, with the measurement of acidity, but some a measure of the amount of acid present. And so in this case, we're refer referring to a food or an ingredient. And so um, humans, as well as microorganisms, as well as many foods really lie in this, this neutral zone. And so um, being exposed to too much acid or too much base is really um, harmful to, to us and to microorganisms. And so by reducing acid, you can really um, you know, impact the, the ability of a, of a bacteria to grow. Um, so as far as specialized processes go, acidity plays an important role in fermentation here. And so if we're getting that um, acidity down far enough, we are going to be um, allowing that fermentation to, to grow and also prevent pathogens. So when we get into more specifically a, a variety of fermentations here, so to talk a, a minute about vegetable fermentation. So vegetable fermentations, in most cases, this is, a, is an example of a naturally occurring bacteria in vegetables um, that are allowed to, we, we alter the conditions and allow them to grow. And so we see this in products such as kimchi, sauerkraut, pickled cucumbers, a variety of other products. And so we're going to see fermenters such as lactobacillus, leuconostoc, pediococcus, so those lactic acid bacteria growing. And these fermentations tend to be a little bit more in, unpredictable because they are being, um, they are allowing, allowed to be naturally occurring, but it also allows for more fermenter growth if you allow them to, to go more naturally. And so um, a salt or brine is, is added to the vegetables and the salt or brine mixture is really critical part to the fermentation for a variety of reasons. So it helps the fermenters pull the nutrients. So in this case, water and sugars um, from the vegetables for the fermenters to, to eat and to be able to grow. It favors fermenter growth because it, it allows them to um, to outcompete pathogens and potential spoilage microorganisms, the spoilage microorganisms that could potentially interfere with pathogen growth or, or with fermenter growth, um, but then it also helps them to outcompete against pathogens. It also really impacts the, the flavor profile and the, the texture profile that you're looking for. So it creates crisper vegetables and really um, imparts that nice um, fermentation flavor. And so the acid and sequential growth of fermenting microorganisms also contributes to the vegetable tartness and that sequential growth, there's this, this sequ sequential growth that occurs in terms of there are a variety of, um, of lactic acid bacteria that are growing. And so lactic acid bacteria one, um, you know, will will you'll see an uptake in its growth. It'll start to die off. The next one will cook, kick in. And that progression is really what's, what's necessary to create um, the ultimately result in the fermentation. So when we think about vegetable fermentations and food safety, um, there are several factors that we want to think about here um, if, if, if thinking about what this would look like at retail. So ultimately, you want to make sure that the, the ingredients that are being sourced are, are grown with good food safety practices, right? So the vegetables that are being brought in for your fermentation, um, you have reduced the risk as much as possible um, to, to make sure that, that pathogens aren't, aren't there as, as much as you can. Um, but a major driver here with, with vegetable fermentations is that it must occur between that 41 degrees and 135 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, which allows for pathogen growth. We know that's the, the temperature danger zone, right? And so um, hazards of concern here are salmonella, pathogenic E. coli, which are 
um, the, the pathogens that would potentially be, be introduced um, on the field or prior to the fermentation. But you also have to think about the potential environmental contaminants such as Staphylococcus aureus or Listeria monocytogenes. So that's where a contaminant could be introduced um, after, while, or after the fermentation is occurring. And so something um, that has come up here is that, you know, we, we really drill, you know, the, the danger zone numbers at temperature zone between 41 and 135. And I serve on the North Carolina Variance Committee where we um, meet about once a month to, to discuss um, plans that have been submitted um, from North Carolina operators. And there was an example recently where there was an operator who wanted to do um, a fer fermentation at refrigerated temperatures. And you know, you could you could see the reasoning behind it, right? They wanted to, to really reduce that risk of pathogenic organisms growing because they were, you know, used to, to following the food code and all these other ways. But then, you know, going back to them and saying, well, you know, you're not really going to um, have a great fermentation occurring from this, you know, if, if it'll even take off at all. So being able to find that balance. Um, so that covers the vegetable fermentations. And we'll talk a, few, a little bit more about a couple of other examples a little bit later, but I did want to touch um, on dairy fermentation. So this, these are items like yogurt, cream fresh and kefir. And I'll talk about all of those here in a bit, but dairy fermentations are uh, mostly differ from vegetable fermentations from the perspective that um, in dairy fermentations, a lot of times a starter culture is being added. So that allows for a more consistent fermentation. And so in large commercial operations, that's really where you're going to see them relying on that starter culture. And again, we go back to this lactic acid bacteria that's formed as a byproduct of the starter culture and, and creates that, that fermentation reaction. And um, with, with dairy fermentations, comparing them to vegetable fermentations where we had to worry a bit about the potentially product that was introduced, um, the initial product that you're starting with being contaminated. You, um, with dairy fermentations, in most cases, you are dealing with a pasteurized product. So really making sure that, that the ingredient that you're starting with has been pasteurized to kill pathogens that would compete with the starter culture and, of course, would create a riskier product. Um, some other things to, to think about here is just very important to ins ensure that the equipment is, is smooth and easily cleanable. It's been properly cleaned and sanitized before each oh. year. Yeah, well, I gotta check it out. So, uh, oh, what oh, yeah, are so in fermentation or no? And um, also to prohibit uh, bare hand contact. So again, similarly to the ve the vegetable fermentations, we're we're seeing um, that incubation needs to occur in that temperature danger zone that can allow pathogens to grow. So again, here we're thinking about uh, potential environmental contaminants such as staph or, or listeria. So to touch briefly on fermentation starter cultures, just thinking about um, if, if you're seeing retail HACCP plans or, or um, you know, these specialized processes, um, because this is now to talk a little bit more about other food safety considerations. So in many cases, the starter culture must be added to a food to drive the fermentation. And so you, you may see that um, as part of a, of a plan. So if a starter culture is added, it, it, it's, it's critical that it's from an approved supplier or otherwise tested because we don't want to you know, have, have a supplier that isn't, isn't approved and have, has contaminated the, the starter culture um, because that could potentially contaminate any future product. And similarly, making sure that previously fermented batches of food for um, using them as a starter culture, which is known as black back slopping, is, is not being used um, because that comes with a root, uh, increased risk of acid tolerant E. coli. So for these reasons, it makes it really critical to use a new commercial starter culture for each for each batch. Some other things to think about when we talk about um, fermentations a little bit more broadly is, is the containers. And so um, the types of containers that you may see may, could vary with the size of the operation, but of course, just making sure that they're always, always food grade, um, especially when, when seeing some of these smaller operations. Um, they should be easy to clean. You know, you're gonna see a lot of these, um, these components that are that match other required equipment, right? Um, so easy to clean, no scratches, chips, or pits. Um, 
it should be washed in hot soapy water before using. And to talk a little bit about some of the different materials that are used for these types of contaminators. So they're ceramic. Um, one thing to, to be aware of is that older crocs that were made before the 1970s, those older ceramic crocs can sometimes um, contain lead paint. And so making sure that they um, do not contain lead. Um, when thinking about vegetable fermentations, making sure that those vegetables are fully submerged in that um, salt brine fluid. Um, so that allows them to stay under anaerobic conditions to really favor that growth of lactic acid bacteria and um, making sure that that salt covering is, is occurring really allows for more competition. And so it's important to keep them covered as well. You may see, um, uh, containers such as such as glass, so making sure that they are not chipped and, and all of those factors that we just went over, and also um, avoiding plastics that contain um, phthalate and bisphenol, knowing that the product's going to be in there for weeks. So really just making sure that you're aware of what, what containers are, are being used. Um, so I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time drilling into this, this table um, really specifically because we've touched a lot on the pathogens already, but just to, to talk a little bit about um, the looking at the pathogens just briefly in terms of shigatoxin producing um, E. coli is, you know, is, is more of a concern with, with the sausage, but knowing that um, staph or AS is really the pathogen of concern when it comes to um, that, that staph toxin risk. And so in most cases, we're really trying to draw that pH down to less than 4.2. And with the staph toxin risk, that's why we're seeing um, yogurt for less than 5.3 within 10 hours. And so for these other ones, the science really is there to support the timeframes in terms of fermentations, you know, especially with, when we think about sauerkraut and kimchi. So what we want to see is, is the pH dropping quickly enough and um, really getting to below that 4.2. And so this is where the time is, is, is dependent on the product and on the temperature and other factors. And so taking a look at the plan to see what other um, variables are, are at play here is, is really important. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about current trends and, and some other things that have been going on um, a little bit more recently with, with a variety of fermented foods. So the first one that I wanted to talk about could, um, had to was, was really important to, to cover here was tempeh. Um, which resulted in an outbreak about 10 years ago. So a little bit less recent, but still very much relevant. And for those of you who are not familiar with, with tempeh, that's a product where soybeans are cooked and mashed. And it's a really high protein, high fiber um, product. And it results in that it really earthy flavor um, that gets stronger as it ages. And that, that earthy flavor comes about from the fermentation that occurs when vinegar and a fungal starter are added to that soybean paste and the, the fungi um, that is that it consumes the vinegar and then is allowed to grow for two to three days. And so um, in the case of unpasteurized tempeh, this is really where that can allow pathogens to grow. And so there was an outbreak in Asheville, North Carolina, so not too far from where I'm located, uh, back in 2012, where there were 88 illnesses and several hospitalizations. And ultimately, it was found that um, the salmonella was linked to the fungal starter culture here. And so it was uh, it was the original um, supplier, the, the salmonella fungal starter culture. Um, and so that really highlights the need for that really verified supplier um, source. Um, you know, of course, in this case, it was the, the starter culture, but there are several other factors that we would need to think about here in terms of um, other potential risk. And so ultimately just knowing that this pack, this product was unpasteurized, um, unless it's noted on the packaging, really treating tempeh as a raw food. So just like you would handle a raw meat. And so in cases where tempeh is unpasteurized, making sure that that's being communicated to the, to the consumer or the, um, the, the buyer. And just thinking about other SOPs that we, we see time and time again, making sure that knives, cutting boards, other food contact surfaces are cleaned and sanitized between preparation and use. Um, knowing that salmonella and other pathogens can grow during the production process. And then of course, hand washing. Um, it, anytime you're handling any potentially contaminated food or packaging. Um, and in this case, I think it 
in some ways it came down to that need for a positive food safety culture as it related to being aware of the risk, um, knowing ways that you could reduce the risk, and then communicating with, with your customers. So kombucha is one product that we're seeing more and more of at retail. Um, and so, you know, you all can probably attest to that as this beverage gains in popularity. And so um, it is a fermented tea beverage. And so it is a black tea combined with a, a sugar and a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, which is also known as a SCOBY. And so there are some claimed health benefits, um, but most of which have not really been um, really proven in the literature, but there are a lot of um, claimed benefits and, and folks who really want to, to consume this product. Um, we, in, this, in this case, we're seeing the pH drop from around five or a little bit more to about 2.5 in about seven to 10 days. And so with this, we see you know, several possible hazards and you're gonna see a, a trend here with, with fermented foods where we're seeing the need for good SOPs to making sure that suppliers and the ingredients that you're, you're introducing from the very beginning are um, sourced from safe sources, that you're reducing that risk of, of ingredients being contaminated, and you're also reducing the risk of any other environmental hazards being, um, being introduced. Um, there's also a risk, um, which, is, which is less of a, of a food safety risk in, in most cases, but there's also the risk of the SCOBY um, being contaminated by molds, yeasts, or fungi. And so that's really important to, to examine for any signs of contamination. Um, there's also some, some allergen risks here. Just uh, there have been some reports that folks who have a sensitivity to, to molds and, and other types of foods like that or types of allergies, they may ex experience um, similar allergic reactions after consuming. But one of the, one of the main um, risks that has, has come up related to kombucha is not necessarily one that we always think about as it relates to food safety, but just the alcohol level. So it can be difficult to consistently um, monitor and be aware of what um, the, the alcohol level can be, um, especially among different um, kombucha products. And so um, that, you know, that of course, if, if you're not aware that you're consuming alcohol can be a big concern for if you're, if you're feeding this, um, if you're giving this beverage to, to children or if pregnant women are consuming it or just folks who don't intend or desire to be consuming alcohol. So that's very much something to be aware of. Um, so it goes back to those, those SOPs and, and monitoring once it gets to the bi biological hazards. So when we think about um, kimchi, that is a Korean fermented vegetable mixture that's commonly made from cabbage and, and radish. And similarly, it has some claimed health benefits. Its pH is around 4.5, so, so right around that potentially um, dangerous pH zone. And so really making sure that that fermentation is occurring rapidly. So going back to that time temperature combination. Um, and then also just, you know, being aware of other potential biological risks. Of course, this is a vegetable fermentation. So making sure that those um, initial ingredients that you're introducing, um, you have a reduced risk of, of um, potential pathogens there. So then when we talk about um, kefir, so kefir, for those of you who are not familiar, is a cultured milk beverage. Um, so it has a uniform creamy consistency and it has a flavor. I'm told I've never, I've never had kefir, but it has a flavor somewhere between buttermilk and, and sour cream with a mild yeasty aroma. And so it's created by combining milk with a kefir culture and kefir culture is a combination of yeast and lactic acid bacteria. And it has claimed health benefits similar to, to yogurt. Um, and when properly fermented as, as we can, as we see with, the reduction of pH and other products, it reduces many pathogens, but, but not all. And so that's when we start to worry about some of those acid tolerant um, bacteria. And so really thinking about SOPs related to suppliers, to the maintenance of equipment, um, and the refrigeration will vary with, with that pH level, but really going back to that supplier um, role. 
And so for our, the retail HACCP class that we offer through Safe Plates, we really focus on specialized process and writing HACCP plans. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some, some examples of what we cover there. And so um, what we may see in a basic fermentation process. And then I, I wanna talk about it a little bit more specifically to something like yogurt. And so with, um, with looking at the general steps of what the goal is for a specialized process, it is to convert a TCS food to a non-TSCS food, right? And so with this, as we've been talking about with how a fermentation progresses, you add your starter culture or you select for your naturally occurring culture. You move to that incubation stage so that in that um, temperature zone, allow the bacteria or yeast, depending on the fermentation happening, you allow that to grow, which results in the production of the byproducts. Um, so, so the lactic acid and the variety of other byproducts, which then serve to help drop the pH and um, helps the fermenter um, outcompete spoilage organisms and, and pathogenic organisms, which then that drop in pH uh, renders it a non-TCS food. And so thinking about um, what we might see in something like a yogurt uh, fermentation. So this is very common in retail establishments because this is a great option for restaurants who may want to control the consistency and texture of their, of their yogurt um, for a little bit more um, than, than what they could you know, purchase at the store. And so in this case, we would see um, We'd be using a pasteurized milk product. So if you think back to the dairy fermentations that we cover, um, a pasteurized milk product ensures that pathogenic microorganisms are likely not present. The milk is heated to 180. So we're doing that to, to reduce the spoilage microorganisms, which could, could potentially outcompete the, the fermenters that we really want to drive the fermentation cool the product and then put it, um, you know, we, we want to cool that down to an incubation temperature um, where we can really allow lactic acid bacteria to grow. And you want to cool it also to, you don't want to kill off their fermenters. Um, you want to add the starter cultures in this case. And so we're, we're um, we may be purchasing it from a grocery store. Um, so, but ultimately making sure it's that approved source. And so um, you ultimately only want lactic acid bacteria introduced into your yogurt, right? Not pathogens. And so making sure that you're only introducing lactic acid bacteria. And so allowing that incubation. And so as, um, as that process, that fermentation process occurs, you'll start to see a thickening and consistency and te temperature. And so, um, you know, by, by four hours or so, you're going to see something that's a lot more solid and what you would expect to see from a traditional yogurt. And so it's that, it's that lower um, pH product. And so when we think about yogurt fermentation, if, if we want to talk through a little bit of the, the, the details of what a hazard analysis might look like, we're, we're, we would be concerned with Staphylococcus aureus here, right? Um, because that's that's what the potential environmental contaminant. Um, we of course have other concerns as it relates to um, you know the production of it, but those other concerns would be falling under the code. And so for this, we are looking specifically at what would fall outside and outside the code under the specialized process. And so the CCP would be that fermentation process at the specific time and temperature, which is going to be informed by a lot of the other details provided by the operator. Uh, the critical limit is the pH reaching below 4.2. And those corrective actions are going to include, um, you know, they could include continuing fermentation within the time allowed, but it may need to include um, discarding the, the product. So a couple of things to, to zoom out a bit and to talk a little bit about validation and, and verification when we think about validating fermentation HACCP plans um, based on the risks that we've that we've talked about today. Um, I wanted just to take a minute to distinguish between the terms validation and verification. And so validation is the element of verification that focuses on collecting and evaluating information, the scientific and technical information, determine if the HACCP plan will control the hazards. 
So basically making sure that the process that you have proposed is, sorry about that, um, making sure that the process will work to control the hazards, whereas verifications is activities, um, making sure that the plan is actually being followed. And so um, just wanted to, to put that there for, for consideration. And so when we think about guidelines for validating fermentation HACCP plans, there are a lot of, um, a lot of considerations that, that to take into account. Um, so those prerequisites and SOPs, what the operator has in place to really reduce that risk of environmental contamination, conducting the hazard analysis, um, the, the identified critical control points that they make sense in reference to, to everything else that you're seeing, the critical limit, um, identifying the monitoring procedure. So primarily who's going to be testing that pH, how often is it going to be done, what type of pH um, uh, meter is, is, is being used and calibration, all of those types of things. Um, the records that are being identified, how you're training folks, and then ultimately your, your verification, verification process. Um, so in, in summary, just to kind of review what we've, what we've talked about, um, this really in, in terms of thinking about food safety and the potential of, of food safety risks with fermented foods, that reduction of pH really acts to control many pathogens. And ultimately we really want to make sure that SOPs are in place to really reduce that risk when it comes to environmental controls, um, using pasteurized um, ingredients and other good supply, good supplier um, ingredients when, when needed and tested recipes. Um, and ultimately, you know, we've we found in our experience that it's it's really helpful to have that partnership with with extension or other technical experts, so that you can really find ways to, um, you know, of course, make sure that the risk is reduced as much as possible, but really allowing operators to do the process that will give them the products that they that they want to have the best quality product and to reduce um, throwing away food that that ultimately isn't a public health risk and really trying to find um, the balance of all of all of that and making sure that um, you know you're you're getting that that safe product, um, and so with that I will um, conclude this presentation. But I believe I have a few minutes for questions. I'll turn it back to you, Katie. Yeah, that was great. You do have some questions in chat, and let me go ahead and um, feed those to you. There, one was sort of ties into your last comment there about there's of course been um, a real increase in cottage food laws and allowance for people to do these kinds of processes through cottage food uh, laws that are now uh, acceptable. Do you have concerns about that? And I'm thinking with your outreach, this is a great question for you to start with. Yeah, I mean, so there are, I mean, of course, anytime you have folks who are making a potentially hazardous product, you know, you want to make sure that as, as many controls are in place as, as possible, but that's where it really comes to, I think, making sure that the connections are in place with finding that, um, you know, fermentation expert in that specific product to really, to really work with folks and, and to really make sure that, you know, as, as you said, Katie, making sure that communication is out there so that people know what regulations need to be followed, what, what the, the, um, you know, requirements are, and then what they ultimately need to do to reduce risk. An extension is the place to start often. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And that's sort of the second question after that was about resources and extension service. Yes, yes. And my my email is here at the bottom. You know, if you have any um, have any specific questions, I know it does tend to get a bit um, complicated across states. And so depending on the version of the food code you're on and just all of those things, but we are always happy to um, to connect, serve as connectors and and answer as many questions as, as we can. Perfect. Okay, here's the next question. This is sort of interesting. How would you verify commercial starter culture for dairy products that it's actually safe and approved? What what is we just kind of um, accept if it's commercial, it's good. Is there any follow up that should be done? Yeah, so that's that's a good question, and I I can't really speak to the specifics on that. I mean, I think there is kind of this general accepted that if you're purchasing a starter culture, you know, if you if you are say buying yogurt at the grocery store, there's that general acceptance that it's 
um, that it's going to be safe. But I think there are other um, kind of cer certificate of analysis that you can request um, from, from suppliers and those types of things. So working with them and also kind of going back to, to asking your, um, you know, your fermentation specialists, what they would recommend for that specific, um, you know, specific product. Very good. Uh, somebody asked about the Tempe outbreak that you mentioned. Do you know, uh, was that something from a, somebody making that in a home situation? They said apartment and selling online, or is there any more about that outbreak you could share? So, yeah, so I, I cannot speak specifically to the making it at home, but I do know that it was being sold online because I remember as that was kind of unfolding, and I know my North Carolina regulators could probably speak more to this, um, I, the the online, um, whatever the, the brand was, I can't remember, I think it was actually in my, in my pictures here. Uh, oh, that is really small. Um, I can't quite read it, but, but basically it was, it was available on online, um, and, and they basically stopped selling online. Um, so I can't speak to whether it was, it was produced at home, but yeah. yeah that sounded familiar to me as well. Very good. Mm -hmm. Um, the, another question here was, do you have any thoughts about, so the food code requires, uh, TCS foods that have to be date marked, um, do you have any thoughts on date marking for fermented foods? And the reason the person asked the question is that the Conference for Food Protection, um, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but we people submit issues for making changes to the code. Um, in 2016, there was an issue um, proposing to exempt fermented foods from date marking. Any thoughts you have on that idea? Yeah, so I... I feel that I cannot speak as well to, to that, but I would be, you know, interested to see what, what continues in that discussion at CFP. Now I'm looking for additional questions. Um, any concerns with fermenting items such as sauerkraut, kimchi, under refrigeration? Um, our department generally requires this for fermentation. The vegetables would be at a higher pH for um, some period of time. I think this gets to that, the slide that you were showing with the graph about it takes some time to get that pH to drop to 4.2. And the concern we have is how long is it gonna be there? We haven't hit 4.2, but they wanna have it above the 41. How, what kind of time frames and concerns in there do we have? Yeah, I mean, so that is definitely, and this is where, you know, I hate to have that answer of it depends, but it does yeah. depend. And that's where, um, you know, we, uh, I think really going back to your, your fermentation folks, you know, we, we work really closely with, with Joelle Eifert at Virginia Tech, and she, you know, knows, knows a ton about fermentation. And so, you know, I think really emphasizing that, that fast decline, which I know is not any, is not a hard and fast rule, but I think that's where you're also wanting to see what's that time temperature combination is in reference to other parts of the of the plan. So what else is what else is being done? And is that um, pH drop really directly related to temperature? Or does that depend? No, I mean, it also is so and that's where you need to get into your pH meter, whether that's being potentially te temperature sensitive. But um, you know, I think, I think the thing with, with the refrigeration is just that it may, um, you know, slow the actual fermentation process, but as you said, you know, really making sure that it gets that pH drops as, as quickly as possible, because of course you don't want it just hanging out in that, in that zone. And so, um, that's where I think having, having folks review the plans closely can be helpful. So it's really about having a thorough HACCP plan with good documentation of their process. Right. Yeah, it's a case by case. Yeah, it depends. I got you. Um, here's another one. A facility is making koji as a starter culture to ferment their miso. Would that be considered backslapping or just one more step in their fermentation process? Um, so I am I am less familiar with with miso and koji. Um, so I may have to look into that one and get back to you if that's all right, Erica. <laughs> um, the final pH for Tempe 
stays in the peat potentially uh, potentially hazardous food range. Does that mean, again, this is the date marking that they would have to require it? I guess maybe that's a code question. Um, <laughs> and it would, I'm gonna go back to your, it depends. So um, it would depend on their process and what's been approved, but the code would say they have seven days if it's a TCS food period, and then they would have to discard. I hope that answers that question for them. Um, see if we have time for one more here. Does commercially prepared yogurt sold at the retail count as a starter culture? That's a great question. For example, if you name, if you took a Kroger brand to act as a starter, could you do that? Yes, that is considered a starter culture. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we got quite a few questions in. Um, I want to thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, North Carolina State and all your colleagues, Dr. Chapman was talked about a lot this morning, um, have been such a phenomenal resource for everybody in retail food, not only industry, but regulatory as well. And really, really appreciate um, your presentation and um, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Shoemaker. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, with that, we look like we're on pretty good on schedule here. And our next presentation is actually a panel discussion. And we're going to be talking about going green with reusable containers. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce, we have three panelists, and I'll introduce them to you. Christina will be starting with us. Christina Springer is with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. She serves as their retail food safety specialist and as the program subject matter specialist in all areas of retail food. She, of course, collaborates with industry, government agencies, the public and staff to provide guidance on developing food safety strategies and controls. And she's also uh, responsible for training and standardization of staff. Prior to working for ODA, Christina worked for 10 years in both the private and the public sectors, where she was responsible for inspecting and evaluating food safety systems. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in environmental and occupational health from California State University at Northridge. And I do want to mention before Christina gets started, just I thought we didn't talk about this, Christina. I don't know if you're going to do that in your own intro. Um, but Oregon Department of Agriculture is primarily responsible for um, retail food stores and Oregon Health does the restaurants. Just to give you a little background on that. Sorry if you were going to include that. Our second panelist uh, is also a regulator. Susan Shelton is with Washington State Department of Health. Um, she's been in public health at the state's level and local level since 2000 and has worked as an educator, inspector, program supervisor, and advisor. She's currently the program lead for produce safety, multi-location consistency, the state food service rule revision and interpretation, and recently the FDA program standards. Go, Susan. Uh, in addition to facilitating statewide retail food advisory groups, group. Uh, Susan regularly provides trainings to regular, regulators, industry, and the public and has uh, a bachelor's in science from Eastern Washington University. And our third panelist is Jocelyn Correll. She is with Bold Reuse. Some of you may be more familiar with the previous name, which was GoBox, um, that uh, certainly is around in the Northwest. Uh, recently renamed, same company. Uh, Jocelyn is the CEO of Bold Reuse. She specializes in developing strategy and leading the implementation of reuse systems that support society's transition to circular economic models. Jocelyn has over a decade of experience growing asset share systems, first at Zipcar, then at Alta Bicycle Share, now known as Motivate. And in her free time, she likes to garden, ride bikes across the Pacific Northwest with her husband and dog, Bruno. So those are our three panelists. And again, as I said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to uh, Christina to get us started and give us a little background on ODA's approach to the growing interest um, of reusable containers and some of the challenges. Good I afternoon. see your slides. You're good to go. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. It's an honor to be here and share a little bit of Oregon's experiences with refillable food containers. 
This has really been a very hot topic in our state. I'd say I've been with the state for 10 years now, and I've seen the uh, really this topic increase exponentially. We're really seeing a significant trend in really our stakeholders' desire to reduce plastic waste associated with retail stores here in Oregon. So just to give a really brief uh, background on some of these trends, um, we've seen a plastic straw ban in recent years. We're seeing a lot of our retail grocery partners come up with all kinds of incentives and discounts for customers to use uh, reusable grocery bags. We have cities in Oregon, such as Ashland, that have really come up with some innovative ways to provide reusable containers at both their restaurants and in their grocery stores. We've seen an uptick in demand and plan reviews and interest in opening zero waste grocery stores. Uh, those will be stores where really no plastic is being utilized. We're seeing an interest um, in third party companies and Jocelyn will talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. And innovations that are popping up in our grocery stores um, when we, as consumers and regulators, such as Loop. So basically what we're seeing here is industry, our consumers are really being innovative and coming up with all kinds of great ideas to help reduce plastic waste. So the question that is now being posed is ODA as regulators, how are you gonna help partner with us on reducing waste associated with retail stores? So that's, that's a, a fair question. And when our agency has been receiving all of these calls, really the first step for us is to look internally. I will not go over this slide, I promise, but I showed this specifically because our rules are not easy. They're not easy for our industry. They're not easy for consumers. And to be honest, they're sometimes not easy even as a regulator to try to explain to industry what's allowed and what's not allowed. So in our quest to try to determine what we can do to change and help reduce waste, we have to really look at our rule and identify what is allowed, what's not allowed, and what should we change. So one of the first things we did, and I'm going to go through this quickly given the time period, is we provided a training to all of our field inspectors basically on this section of code. We broke it apart section by section with pictures to show what's allowed. So I'm going to briefly go through this. In Oregon, you can bring in your non-food specific container at a water vending machine. I think we're pretty much all familiar with these. They've been around for decades. Um, one of the newer innovations, you can see the picture on the right. Portland Airport, now we can refill our water bottles after we pass through security. So this is allowed and acceptable. In Oregon, you can refill a beverage container with a non-time temperature control for safety food. So this is really, we are uh, micro brew capital here. We love our beer. So growler returns, you fill it with one type of beer, you bring it home, you bring it back in and you try another kind of beer. Um, this is allowed provided that there's a contamination free process. Uh, the same with the picture to the right is one of our retail establishments set up a really great system for self-service kombucha. So they have posted instructions and tubes to be used and this is permitted. We do allow TCS beverage refills provided there's a contamination free process. So when you're visiting here in Oregon, you can bring your favorite coffee mug and go to your local uh, barista and request a latte or cappuccino and provided it's a contamination free process and the company has a policy in place, um, that is acceptable. This one I'm just gonna go over briefly, we really don't see a lot of this, is that at a retail establishment, a refillable container is allowed if it is cleaned and refilled at a food processing plant. So that doesn't really necessarily help the retail food establishment um, internally do that washing and cleaning. So now that we've provided a really brief overview, that's all that's allowed. So the big question then becomes, well, if that's allowed, what is prohibited? And unfortunately, the answer is everything else. So I know a lot of us talk about how we have not followed our own code. We have brought in reusable cloth grocery bags to grocery. And according to our current code, uh, this is not allowed. Refilling in a bulk section, even if it's a non-TCS, non-ready-to-eat food, that is currently prohibited. Our co-ops have instituted uh, reusable exchange programs. Unfortunately, that is not allowed either. 
our grocery stores or retailers that are interested in wash, rinsing, and sanitizing in-house, similar to what is allowed in the 2017 FDA model code, is currently not allowed. We can, we can try to get there through a variance, but according to our code, that is not permitted. So now that our program has really dived into a really good understanding of our rules, the question is what now? So what we have communicated to our team is we have not completed a rule change yet. So we need to provide a consistent message to industry, to consumers, to our stakeholders. And that's really, we need to follow the current rules here in Oregon, which I briefly went over. The second option is to pursue a variance. We have had a number of firms successful in pursuing a variance and being able to get that process approved. Uh, the other option we've discussed with industry is using a third party provider um, to provide those containers. That is something that has been allowed. Uh, after that step, we really want to hear many voices. I'd have to say from the beginning of understanding and talking about this topic to where I stand today, um, based on all of the stakeholders I've worked with and the voices I've heard from, I, I have seen a kind of a shift in um, some of the understanding, gaining a greater understanding of this. So we really have wanted to, we have a reusable stakeholders committee and we are a part of the CFP refillable container committee. So I'm excited to say that we are working on draft rules. I saw the most recent draft last week and we'll actually be working on it this afternoon after I get off the call. So we that's moving pretty quickly in Oregon and I hope that our next meeting we'll have something here from Oregon to report to the group. And thank you for your time. And I look forward to answering questions at the end. Thank you so much. Susan is bringing hers up. Susan, Susan Shelton. Tap control. Perfect. Thank you very much. Good to have everyone here today and talking with us about refillable reusables. I always enjoy working with uh, Christina because we um, had a very similar path to our um, changes in Washington state. So I want to thank you all for joining us and talking with us. And again, I'm reaching out to you from the only state in the U.S. named after a president. We actually have about 40,000 retail food establishments, with the vast majority overseen by 35 local health jurisdictions or occasionally a tribal partner. Institutions and facilities such as hospitals, nursing homes, child care centers, prisons, and our ferry system are overseen by uh, several state agencies, such as Department of Health or um, our Health and Human Services in the state. Currently, we have 29 of our uh, local health jurisdictions, a federal partner, and our Department of Health Food Safety Program enrolled in program standards. Today, I'd like to highlight a little bit about our rural revision process and the recent changes that we made to um, our state code to allow refillable reusable containers. In Washington, our state, um, we adopt the, the food code, the going through the long form version. And so we have a several year stakeholder comment process. Just give me one second, please. So we go through a long form process um, and have uh, several years of stakeholder comments. Our most recent code adoption began in 2018 and became effective earlier this year. Like ODA, we were previously using the 2009 version before we adopted the current food code. We start our rule revision process by requesting comments on the differences between the new food code with our existing state food rule. We provide the comments to our, stand, our standing statewide food safety advisory council, which has members from across public health, industry, consumer, and academia. They traditionally meet quarterly to review food safety issues. But during the rule revision process, we met monthly to develop a consensus draft of the food rule, which we then shared across the state via seven public comment sessions. The comments were then reviewed by the Food Safety Advisory Council for final language to provide to the State Board of Health. During this rule revision process, we adopted date marking and certified food protection manager requirements for the first time. We allowed partially cooked fresh fish without parasite destruction. We allowed pet dogs on the premises and still by far over hundreds and hundreds of customer comments were related to the, um, the actual refillable reusables. 
So like Oregon, we recognize the consumer and industry demand for allowing additional options for refilling containers. We've also had several statewide and local legislative mandates to reduce consumable waste inside of our state. And we knew we needed to actually find alternative options for our food establishments. So when we started our food role and, and, and Christina detailed it really clearly in the previous session, we noticed that the 2009 food code had two separate sections related to refill, refillable reusables. And um, although we adjusted our food code, our, our numbers in our code, you'll see how these two uh, sections actually got merged into one, one complete section in the current version of the food code. So highlighted in blue, you'll see 3-30417 for preventing contamination from equipment. And highlighted in green, you will see the cleaning requirements from 4603.17 as they were merged in the same section. And now in yellow, you'll see the Washington modifications to the food code. The first is specific to consumer-owned beverage containers. We altered the language to specifically include the option for consumers to refill a clean TCS beverage, such as a latte, without going through a wash, rinse, sanitize cycle of the establishment. Changing it in this subsection actually allows the practice to be done throughout Washington without additional approval. So that was a major change for us. The second though is much larger. The second actually allows consumer owned containers to be filled with other foods as long as the establishment has approval from the regulatory authority. The requirement for approval was a key portion of the statewide consensus pro process. The early draft of our food rule required a written plan only but both our regulatory and industry stakeholders wanted refilling consumer owned containers to be specifically an approval and opt in process only. <laughs> I've included a couple of highlights of the over 400 public comments our State Board of Health received as part of the rural revision. We received emails, postcards, letters, phone messages, and in person comments from consumers, industry, legislators, co ops, and even our local aquarium, all encouraging us to allow refilling of consumer owned containers. We actually had many comments from consumers and others wanting us to make the provision required for all of our food establishments. But at the same time, we received comments from two of our industry associations discouraging the change in the code due to the potential increase of liability or potential risk to consumers. Again, we were working to thread the needle of the stakeholder process and we purposely made the refillable reusable section of our role an opt-in program and required regulatory authority approval. So let's talk about one of the ways that we're implementing our code change on refilling customer containers. I'd like to highlight our AMC toolkit documents that we are creating for this role revision. And at the same time, I'd like to thank the FDA and our AFTO partners for the retail program grants, which are actually providing a, a funding for this and several of our related efforts. We're using the toolkits to focus on active managerial control and encouraging policies, training, and management within establishments. For each of the toolkit documents, we provide a bit of code explanation uh, for operators and regulators. Give operators a tool to develop their policy and employee training, and also provide a potential mechanism for operators that need to submit a plan to their regulator. If you're interested in looking at these documents, please bookmark this page and we'll be adding more documents soon. I'll also give a note, we, we do provide regular updates as we receive additional comments. And so we've got a few more updates that we'll be providing uh, probably next week to these documents. So let's look closely at the toolkit that we have for consumer owned containers. Again, this addition in our Washington code requires approval by the regulatory authority prior to allowing consumer owned containers to be refilled. So this document is intended to be used as a potential application for a written plan. We cover a bit of an introduction and a few lines of establishment information before we get to the meat of the document in section two. On the left um, column, we included three options for refilling that require additional approval under our new code. We've organized the options in increasing levels of potential food safety risk and require additional controls based on each of these levels. Option one includes non ready to eat foods, which are going to include the majority of our bulk foods served with a scoop, such as rice, pasta, beans, and flours. Option two includes ready to eat foods. Our intent is to require a gravity flow chute delivery system to protect the food when it's ready to eat. Potentially spurred by our code change, some of our local grocers are converting their ready to eat bulk spices and seasonings from the small containers with scoops into gravity flow units. Option three includes ready to eat food in open containers, such as deli counters, olive bars, salad bars. 
these would require the container to be washed, rinsed, and sanitized at the establishment <clears throat> or be filled by a food employee. Over on the right column, we included the refilling options that were allowed in the code without additional approval that Christina also mentioned. Water containers, refilling containers um, that were washed at a food processing plant, maybe the growlers that she also identified, uh, non uh, TCS uh, beverages. We did that partially as code education, but also in case our local health partners wanted to use the document to be notified of any refilling processes in the food establishment. One of the lessons we learned during our rural revision and during COVID was that many of our stakeholders were not aware that customer owned containers were not widely allowed in code. And we're now using every opportunity to educate on as many sections of the code as we can. Section four includes a submission checklist. While we try to develop a standard application, we know each food establishment will be unique in their approach. We ask for examples of educational materials designed for consumers to educate them on what can be refilled in the facility. We ask them for detail, which types of uh, containers consumers can refill to make sure we can help them evaluate the risks. Section four continues on the back of the page as well and includes control measures for each of the options. We're looking for consumer and staff training, dispensing equipment or modified staff procedures to protect the unpackaged food and food contact surfaces. We also look for corrective actions with monitoring records. With all of our toolkit documents, we're working to instill employee training and plant maintenance. And to recap, before I hand the reins uh, off to Jocelyn, Washington modified the food code to allow consumer provided containers to be refilled on the operator's capacity and their desire, along with the regulatory authorities' oversight. We organize food into three options to help operators break into refilling. We only update our code on an average of eight year cycles, and we want to be able to um, allow our operators to grow as they provide new options. And this provision actually became effective in March of this year, so we're still breaking out of COVID. And we have minimal uh, field experience with this provision so far, but we're happy to talk more if you're looking to implement similar processes under a variance potentially in your jurisdiction. Again, thank you very much from Washington State, the state that opted not to be called Columbia, so it wasn't confused with the other Washington and DC. Thank you so much. And before uh, Jocelyn gets started on her uh, presentation, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions for our panelists um, after Jocelyn finishes up, please put them into chat and we will get to them. Are you all set, Jocelyn? I believe I am. Can you hear me okay? Hear you and see your slides. You're all set. Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jocelyn Quarrel, and I'm the CEO of Bold Reuse. As Katie mentioned in our intro, uh, we recently renamed the company. We were previously known as Gold, uh, GoBox. Uh, that company actually launched back in 2011. So you might have heard of us um, under that name. We are now Bold Reuse. There, it's, uh, it's a process. So you'll see during um, a few different slides of this presentation, uh, it'll still reference GoBox. But uh, same, same company and so glad to be here speaking with you all today um, about how we are choosing to tackle um, our single use uh, pollution crisis through providing uh, reusable packaging as a service. Um, as I mentioned, the company has been around since 2011. I actually acquired it from the original founder in 2018. Um, and that was that was right about the time that I initially um, uh, started speaking with Christina um, and other uh, regulatory uh, regulators in our area um, to learn about um, best practices, um, things that we should be doing. When I first acquired the business, we were not actively managing the washing of the containers ourselves. It was something that we were outsourcing, but we have now brought those operations inside. So we'll go through all of this and more um, starting now. So uh, I wanted to begin, oh, let me see if I can, here we go, okay, slowly but surely. So start uh, by just kind of finding some foundation and why we're doing this work. So every year, this is the United States alone, we're disposing of over a trillion single use pr uh, products. And this, you know, our current take make waste system of consumption, the negative implications overwhelmingly fall on consumers. So consumers are having to deal with the economic implications of that at the end of the stream, the um, environmental health implications, and they're really starting to push back. So the majority of consumers now want to adopt more circular practices, even if that's not what they're calling it. They're look for, looking for more sustainable options. Everybody, I think, understands that recycling and composting aren't going to get us where as 
you know, as sustainable as what we want it to be, especially when we're thinking about packaging from a um, CO2 emissions perspective. So this is really something that consumers want. And they're actively changing their spending habits to buy more products from brands who are helping them reduce their waste. Um, cities and municipalities are of course um, jumping into the fight as well to try to rein in this crisis as it negatively affects them as well. And so businesses are responding to all of this pressure by committing to zero waste goals, but they're, they're all in the future. And that's because they currently lack the infrastructure and experience to know how to implement and manage reusable packaging programs that could really allow them to meet their customers um, and regulatory um, governmental agencies where they operate um, as well. Uh, meanwhile, the single use packaging, including compostable products, um, they're very, very carbon intensive. They can be uh, expensive and they're getting more expensive um, and they've been slow to source during the pandemic. So with all of this as sort of the problem scope, that's where Bold Reuse is coming in to provide a solution. So we're a full service reuse platform, primarily focused on food service, consumer goods and hospitality businesses that want to eliminate single use packaging and transition to reusable packaging. We help them do that. Uh, and, and three different ways. First, by providing the mission critical services of logistics and sanitation. We back it up with software to provide valuable data insights into their program, how it's working, as well as an overlay of sustainability metrics on top of that. And then strategy support as well. So what's the best, uh, best way to implement a reuse program in this unique business environment? Maybe it takes um, employee training or different incentivization models for customers to really engage with. So that's what we're trying to do is really bring a holistic approach to supporting businesses that want to transition to reusable packaging. Um, and I do want to take a moment to say that, of course, we are um, in support of all of the um, suggested changes and active changes to food codes that allow for more BYOCs, con containers and cups that consumers want to bring their own. Um, we're certainly in support of that I, as a personal, uh, you know, as a shopper who wants to reduce my, my, uh, my footprint, my carbon and waste footprint. I appreciate opportunities um, to do that. But um, as it relates to my perspective as, as the CEO of this business, there's a lot of businesses that don't want to take on um, the additional uh, complexities or liabilities for in-house offered reuse programs. So, so that's, that's, those are really the companies that we're trying to work with as companies that um, they're, they're not looking to bring it in house and they need a third party service solution. Um, I wanted to touch base specifically on these service solutions that we're providing them. Um, so for logistics, we're talking about the delivery of clean containers from our warehouse, from our HQ to the participating business. And, and we're providing them with that, that inventory. So they're hosting it on site, um, pre-utilization pre by the consumer. And then post-utilization of the consumer, we're also picking up those returned used containers from drop sites um, that may or may not be present in, in that business's location. We sort of have a network of drop sites where people can return these reusable containers to. Um, and then on the flip side of logistics, of course, we're providing uh, sanitation services, and we really see this as the mission critical um, linchpin that go that bold reuse is bringing to the market. Um, a lot of people are trying to solve this uh, problem through just technical advances, but at the end of the day, we really need infrastructure and we need labor to support this transition. So that's what we're doing here, and we're we're really proud of the work that we've been doing self-regulating and really industry and leading the reuse industry standards. So um, you can see here a list of some of the work that we've done in collaboration with a food safety consultant here in the Portland metro region. Um, and I can talk, I'll talk a little bit more about um, these aspects later in the presentation. So just to give you an idea of some of the businesses that we're working with, you can see their logos on the screen here. Um, I'll touch on a few key case points. Um, for Starbucks, we worked with them last year to support their Borrow a Cup program that they launched. It was a three month pilot in West Seattle. So we were their um, mission critical service provider doing the logistics and sanitation support, basically visiting five Starbucks locations every morning between four 
uh, and 7.30 a.m. We were vendor management, you know, providing them clean inventory of cups that we had washed the day previous. So we were providing that to their back of house team. And then once we were done working with the clean inventory, we turned our attention to the uh, return. Um, they called it a kiosk. And so our team would then open up that kiosk. We would collect the cups that customers had returned over the pre pre previous 24 hours, backhaul all of that to our warehouse to quality control, wash, sanitize, allowed air dry. And then that cycle can continue again. Um, another uh, case study that I'll talk to talk about uh, quickly is the Portland Trailblazers. This is a new program that we've just launched with our local MBA team um, at this uh, at their venue. It's called the Moda Center, and so we are offering reusable food containers at the club level um, as a starting point to see how consumers and fans sort of respond and react to the ability to join the Trailblazers um, to meet their waste reduction goals. Okay, uh, I wanted to take a minute to share this testimonial from one of our partners um, who, oh, this should be a video, but I'm not seeing the play button. So let's see if it works. If not, we'll just skip ahead. Nope, this does not look like it. Came Hold up. on. Yeah, um, I don't think it transferred. There we go. Oh, apologize for that. No problem. It doesn't look like it transferred. Okay, cool. oh, well, um, let me just talk a little bit about our partnership with New Seasons Market. So this is a regional grocery store chain based here in, in the Portland, Oregon metro. They have 19 locations. Um, started working with them back in 2018. Um, we took it slow, launched in one store. And then once we sort of um, deemed success in terms of both how their internal teams were working with the program and their customers were working with the program. We expanded to three more stores and just kept expanding. So now Bold Reuse um, is available in all 19 area go back, or, um, New Seasons market locations. Um, and New Seasons is both a, um, a vendor, meaning they offer the uh, reusable containers to customers that are shopping um, for foods from the deli counter, um, from the um, uh, cheese counter, from bulk foods, um, including the dry bulk foods, but is also, uh, uh, also like bakery bulk um, and potentially produce as well. Uh, the one department that uh, customers cannot yet use bold reuse is in the meat department. Um, but it's it's been a really wonderful um, marriage of services to, to help New Seasons Market provide more sustainable options to their customers and help them meet their internal sustainability goals as well. All right, so let's talk through, um, I'm hoping the slide will advance. Here we go, how it works. Um, so for consumers, um, there's a couple of different ways that they're going to receive a reusable container. The first is through our subscription program. So similar to like a library or a bike share, people can sign up for our for Bold Reuse and then use our mobile app to check out and return containers across a network of participating vendors and drop site locations. So you can see some screenshots of our app there. It's very user-friendly, fun, easy, bright colors, um, really engaging for folks. So they uh, consumers enter a four-digit code. Every location has a unique code. And then we can really leverage that data to be able to know from an operations perspective, what vendors do we need to visit to restock them with clean containers? Um, and then same on the flip side of the experience for the consumers, once they've returned the containers to one of our drop sites, they report that using our mobile app and we're able to understand what drop sites we need to visit to collect containers that have been returned. Nick's perspective on how it works is for New Seasons Market or any of our other partners. So again, we're providing them with a stock of clean reusables that they then have the responsibility to store in their deli department. And then when a consumer requests a reusable, you know, using that mobile app, the staff does a visual verification that they are good to go. And then they either provide them with the empty container that the customer can then use and go, uh, for, like in the photo, to the bulk section, um, or it can be filled with any of the foods there at the deli section as well. Um, again, this is available across the store, except for at the meat department. And then finally, how it works, uh, and this is from the perspective of our, of our team, Bold Reuse. So um, 
every day we have a team of uh, specialists that are out there helping make the reuse magic happen. So there's a few photos um, of Alexandra delivering some clean containers. We use these transport bins. They oft also get sanitized between use. Um, in the center photo, you can see Alexandra is servicing a drop site. So she's pulling out a reusable liner bag that goes into the drop site. And that's what the containers are actually controlled within. And we transport them back to the warehouse in those, uh, in those containers. Um, and then the last photo there, you can see our employees um, actually going through the wash and sanitation process. Uh, one other program that I want to speak about today, and this is uh, slightly different than the food service program that we've been speaking about up to this point in time, but um, Bold Reuse, in partnership with New Seasons Market, have uh, recently won some grant money to test the feasibility of reusable packaging system for retail products. So we're specifically focusing on glass packaging, and we're looking for local manufacturers of products like sauces, soups, honeys, jellies and jams, peanut butter, um, and beverages that, again, are coming in those glass jars and bottles so that um, what we're trying to set up is a system where customers can bring those glass jars and bottles back to the grocery store, return them into a bold reuse drop site. We collect them, backhaul them to our facility, quality control, wash and sanitize, and then once they're dry and ready to be refilled, we, uh, we move that packaging back to the original manufacturer. Um, the goal here is to curb emissions related to glass recycling, although glass is endlessly recycling, uh, recyclable, I should say. It, it does uh, create quite a bit of emissions and it takes a lot of energy to do. So this is a model uh, to test out if we can reduce those impacts as well as um, build local uh, resiliency and um, and sort of help to buffer, particularly some of these smaller manufacturers to uh, the whims of the uh, market as it relates to the cost of their packaging. And that's been uh, pretty, pretty wild over the past couple of years. Okay, next slide here. Great, wanted to talk a little bit more, oops, about our um, compliances that we've been working towards. So. Um, as Christina mentioned, we were, we're not actively regulated by, by anyone, so we actively regulate ourselves. I mentioned a few ways that we do that, but we got uh, pretty serious about it this past winter, um, really at the behest of one of our clients that was uh, wanting us to provide traceability and, um, and recall uh, procedures. So uh, rather than just jumping to the end, we started working with a consultant at the beginning and building all those foundational compliances, SOPs, uh, prerequisite programs, so that we have a really solid foundation to provide our customers, both the, the, um, the retailers and the vendors, but also their end users, the customers that are using this packaging, um, that things are really safe. So um, we have, uh, good manufacturing practices that we have um, both for employees, but for uh, visitors to our site as well. Um, and those GM GMPs, they go beyond agreements. You know, it's it's really in the, the culture of how we're operating as a business here in our facility and, and how we've organized our facility too. Um, for food safety, we have uh, completed environmental monitoring uh, testing. So, um, it's always interesting when our consultant comes in and, and places a uh, little petri juices around and then a few weeks later we get those results but it's a i think a really important thing that we're keeping an eye on uh, especially as we look to grow our business and of course with growth comes more complexity um okay forwarding on to where we're where we're located right now um our um, hq is here in portland oregon and we are soon to expand to two new uh, markets uh, we're on the road to Park City, Utah, where we're helping uh, the city, the municipality is our client for this program to launch a one month uh, reusable packaging program connecting local restaurants. Um, that's an EPA funded grant that we're really excited about. Um, we're also expanding to Bentonville, Arkansas, that will be to work with Loop um, and a new program that they're soon to launch with Walmart. Um, we're already working with Loop. Christina mentioned them earlier in the conversation, if you're familiar with them. Uh, we do all of their um, services here in the Pacific Northwest for their partnership with Kroger. So we're visiting 25 area Kroger stores every week to collect reusable containers, backhaul them to our warehouse, 
um, do all kinds of data tracking. We're not washing for them at this point in time, which is good because they have both food and non-food uh, products. And right now we're really focusing our washing operations just on our food products. Um, and then soon we'll be expanding to Seattle. Um, quick note on the impact that we've generated, and these numbers are already out of touch, but uh, at the top there, that pilot program with Starbucks that I mentioned last year, um, in just three short months, and this was very much still in the dark days of the pandemic, we um, were able to eliminate over 10,000 cups. Uh, we work with Imperfect Foods um, for helping them sanitize these little uh, reusable gel packs and have eliminated um, more than 617,000 of those from entering in our local landfills. And then um, nearly 400,000 individual containers kept out of our landfills as well um, through this reuse program. Um, so I think that's it and looking forward to taking some of your questions. I saw the chat was, was, was very busy, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we do have some questions and uh, Jocelyn, I'll start with you. Um, do you have any assessment about how many of your reusables are lost to the trash instead of actually collected? And do you have any strategies to address this kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. That's a very complex question, um, but <laughs> it depends on the model. Um, so like our, our open-ended model with our green containers you might be familiar with, um, because it's a subscription-based system and because we're actually um, requiring people to use our mobile app, that is our tool for pro providing both um, uh, sort of a, a, a incentivization method to return it because people cannot just check out endless containers until they return the containers they already have. So we're trying to build out a model that helps shift consumer behavior based on like how we want them to be using GoBox. And that is by returning them very quickly because they use them for a very short period of time. They're not meant for long-term storage. Even if people are purchasing like a bulk product, the idea is take this home with your rice or pasta in it, transport it to another glass container that you might have in your cabinet and then return your reusable so that you can continue to use it. We're not tracking individual containers right now, um, that's a technical functionality that we're introducing in the next few months, though, so we're really excited about it. Uh, one other thing that I'll say about um, attrition and how we're trying to reduce attrition rates, because that's the real magic with, of reuse, is every time a product is reused again, its environmental impact goes down. So we really want to try to reuse things as frequently as possible. Um, we've just, I was mentioning the program that we John, uh, just launched with the uh, Trailblazers MBA team. The really special thing about that opportunity is how closed it is, right? People go to a sports game, they order food, they consume it on site, and then they leave probably with the food packaging still underneath their seat. And that's great because uh, our the environmental services team at the stadium can actually collect that. And in our first um, a few uh, events, we're seeing a, a, a return rate of over 80%, which is a really solid start. And it's only going to get better from there as people um, become more comfortable and familiar with the program. Right. There's a couple of follow-up questions about that are related to that about, do you have any idea about the average life? What span of a individual container? Sure. Yeah, the manufacturer states these can be used like thousands of times. We think in, in the real world where people are are kind of harsh on, on things, um, they can they can definitely last through hundreds and hundreds of uses. We are mindful about aesthetic uh, um, aesthetic sort of conditioning, and we don't want the containers to look so old that people assume age with uh, with not being clean or sanitary. So as these containers age, we do pull them out, and then we're able to recycle them. They're a polypropylene number five product. Because we're talking about products and materials, I just wanted to be uh, clear that um, we are material agnostic. We work with plastic, we work with glass, we work with um, stainless steel, we work with aluminum, so we're material agnostic. These containers we source for customers that don't have their own reusable um, assets, but this is a cup that we used in the Starbucks pilot. This is a cup that Starbucks owns. It's all also a polypropylene number five container, but this is an example of a container that's part of the loop program, right? And it's stainless steel bottom, plastic top. Um, so uh, from our perspective, we're sort of, again, material agnostic, and we just want to find the right material for the use case. Um, there's limited options right now. We're really excited about the development of 
uh, reusable products and finding not only a product that can last through many, many reuses, but also comes from responsible feedstock. And then at, at the end of its life, it can be recovered and ideally made into feedstock for future reusable packaging. That would be the ideal sort of closed loop model that we're striving for. Very good. I have a question for, uh, I'll throw this to Christina. Can you explain how growlers are refilled contamination free by consumers? All right, just unmute myself there. So when growlers took over Oregon a couple of years ago, it happened so fast that we really didn't have the opportunity in many cases to provide education or, or materials to industry. But I feel like now we have really gotten most of um, the facilities in compliance and the way that they're doing it here is through growler tubes. So I'll give you an example of I have a growler and you know I've taken it home, it's been consumed, I rinse it out, I bring it back to the facility. In our current code, they need to rinse it with hot water and then they need to fill it with beer um, using some kind of contamination free process. And what we found works best is a growler tube. So a multi-use food grade growler tube is placed on the top. It's then placed into the container the beer is fed into the container and then the reusable uh, tube is wash, rinse, sanitized, cleaned and before it's reused again. So we are in our draft rule looking at potentially eliminating the hot water rinse. Uh, we don't find that has a significant impact on food safety and that often is bypassed by our facilities because it's very difficult to fill beer into a hot container. So I hope that answers your question. Please, if you have any further questions, you can add them to the chat and I'd be happy to address. Very interesting. I'm going to throw one last question to Susan. Somebody asked about what's the difference really between repeated washing of a cup in a restaurant versus a consumer's cup? I think they're trying to make a point, but Susan, do you have a comment on that? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, yeah, so I think we see the point as well, where if it's a multi-use container, it could be washed at multiple locations and um, so that's one of the reasons why we did uh, modify our code to allow TCS beverages to go into a visually clean cup, um, pretty much wherever it was washed. Um, hopefully, hopefully that works for our consumers as well. Well, thank you all. We are at the end of our time. I know there are more questions from this, from the previous presentations and probably the ones that are coming up uh, later. Um, and those will be um, addressed and uh, available. Um, we'll send those out to the presenters and they'll be available on um, the Nature website at the, um, after the end of the seminar. So we will get to them even if we can't now. I do wanna thank all my panelists as well. These are three incredibly busy people um, and thank you so much for making the time for this. Uh, it was a great job. It is absolutely a growing area that if you are not already facing either as a operator or as a regulator, you will be. So uh, really appreciate hearing from everybody and hopefully some resources and ideas um, for the rest of, of the people listening here. With that, I will go ahead and send it back to Catherine. All right, thank you. Great session. So looking at our agenda, we do have a 15 minute break planned out for everyone. So please use this time, get some more caffeine, do your yoga stretches, keep our energies up because we do have some exciting rest of the day planned for everyone. So see you all in 15 minutes. And to help with time, I will go ahead and put up a watch so that we just keep track of the time. All right, see you guys soon. Um, if you just joined us, thank you for joining us. And for those who have remained with us, thank you for staying on for this uh, later half of our uh, breakout session. Um, as a reminder, if you have questions for our panelists uh, that are gonna be speaking, presenters that we're gonna be speaking, let's put the questions in the chat and we'll move on from there. So unmanned robotic vending food equipment has evolved rapidly over the last several years to 
become much more complex. There's machines that make and vend pizza, salad, soft serve, cookies, milk, boba tea, and more challenges arise in how these operations are managed and inspected. We'll take uh, you through some of the innovations and provide some information on the latest technologies, the sanitation certification process, standard operating procedures, and support services necessary to minimize risk. To help us with that today, we have two presenters that are going to talk about unmanned food operations and evolving equipment. I'll start by introducing Brian Turner. Brian's with the National Automatic Merchandising Association, or NAMA. Brian has over 35 years of experience in the field of regulatory, grocery, manufacturing, training development, food service, and vending. Roles have included auditing, food safety, quality assurance, workplace safety, and supply chain management. Brian has a BS in environmental health from Illinois State University. Currently he conducts evaluations on new vending machines and recertifications for existing models for the NAMA Machine Evaluation Program, or MEP. Additionally, he provides consultation to NAMA members in support of the MEP. Following Brian will be Candace Sims. Candace is a plan review supervisor with Southern Nevada Health District. Candace Sims has worked with Southern Nevada Health District for 15 years as an environmental health specialist. She's currently the supervisor for plan review. She often encounters many innovations related to specialized equipment and processes on the Las Vegas Strip and beyond. We're grateful to both of you for your willingness to present today. And with that, we'll start with Brian. Brian, you have control. Thank you very much, Brad. Can everyone hear me? I hope so. Well, thank you very much for everybody, for Catherine, Candace, and everyone, not, not show, FDA, everyone for inviting me. And I hope everyone's having a great afternoon. Um, just wanted to make sure that we have an opportunity to kind of give you a little insight on, I'm kind of do more of the meat and potatoes type. Uh, Candace probably a much more uh, uh, interesting presentation, but let's give a little insight behind how NAMA does uh, their machine evaluation program. I've uh, been with them for a little over six months now, seven months. So it, it's been a something that have been able to kind of utilize my, my past experiences, but also quite quite the learning curve as well as we move forward, as Brad said, with all these different innovations and machines are coming out. So uh, next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about the National Automatic Merchandising Association, or NAMA, uh, a little bit about the machine evaluation program, or we officially call MEP, uh, a little bit also about the Automatic Merchandising Health Industry Council, the AMHIC, and uh, the ones that help set our standards over the years. Uh, also talk about the standards themselves, uh, the NAMA construction and design standards of vending machines, emerging types of machines, what I've seen, what I'm hearing, uh, and some of the challenge, frequent challenges I'm having with uh, evaluating these machines uh, as, as they present themselves. Next. Uh, NAMA uh, was established in 1936. Uh, association for, represents about 31 billion U.S. dollars uh, in the convenience services industry. It's kind of not just top vending machines anymore, as we know, with the unintended uh, uh, sites and micro markets and such. So uh, quite a few uh, changes over the years. Uh, nearly about a thousand members of companies, including many that you might know, such as Coca-Cola, Canteen, which is part of Compass, uh, Aramark, Sodexo, uh, Mars, Wrigley. Uh, Mondelez and Nestle Coffee. So some of the household names, but the, just to name a few. Next. And then NAMA, how they supports its memberships. Uh, they uh, you know, research the knowledge sharing, networking, advocacy, and trade shows. So they do have their own, we do have our own trade show. We had it back in April here in Chicago, um, the Chicago area. Uh, and then also next year, uh, it will be in Atlanta. 
So they do we get to see all the latest and greatest machines, talk to some of the operators, how they do their business. Uh, they have training education sessions, so quite the undertaking. Next. The machine evaluation program is like a, a service provided by NAMA, uh, utilizing a public health consultant, such as myself, uh, to make sure the manufacturers are building equipment that conform with the, uh, with the regulations as well as with standards. Evaluation program is open to manufacturers, remanufacturers, and suppliers of equipment, vending machines, equipment, and reach it each in coolers, which you see a lot with the unintended. Uh, it's not just for our members. So you can be uh, part of the MEP program, but you don't have to necessarily be a member to do so. Uh, machines also evaluated to applicable design construction specifications, uh, well, like I said, with the FDA code. Um, and then also uh, what kind of ends up happening after the process is they get a letter of compliance, which gives you a uh, uh, demo letter saying that follows under certain categories, what it's for, how it can be used, um, you know, in only controlled environments, whatever the may, uh, constrictions may be. And that way that also too, you see a lot of that we share with the health departments for people who with new machines or um, taking over a new process, especially in the water world. Uh, we see that quite a bit. And then there is an annual recertification process. So we do have an opportunity to look at the machines again, uh, so if there's any changes, we might update it at that time, may need to have to do another full review, but that wholesale type of changes. So that is something that we typically make sure uh, you know, that everything's still the way it's supposed to be. Uh, some of the pro uh, companies you might see with part of the program, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, uh, Lavaza, uh, Minus 40, Habco, uh, some of the big players as far as that have a lot of machines with NAMA uh, listed. Uh, and making sure that uh, they meet those certain standards. So uh, if it's some, one of the questions I have come up kind of a part of the program is the company is delisted, you might see in our website. Uh, the company may be delisted, but the equipment's still valid as long as there's no changes. And then there, there are, uh, they either have to come back into the program or they have to, you know, no longer utilize the NAMA listing. Next, please. And then uh, what the NAMA's Automatic Merchandising Health and Industry Council, or HAMIC, HAMIC, <laughs> I must say it right myself, uh, it's kind of a cross reference of different folks from regulatory, vending operations, and as well as the industry representatives and manufacturers and such. Uh, a lot of folks utilize the, the uh, program to, to make sure they're looking at a, a, a very um, concise and, and well reviewed third party process. Uh, and then make sure that it, it tests and verified the certain standards, depending on what kind of machine we're talking about. So anything that's food, beverage, or water, uh, or ice for that matter. And then also making sure it meets the standards. Back in 1992 is when the NAMA listing specifically came about uh, and a trademark that you might see down there in the right hand corner uh, on machines across the country. Next, please. The standards themselves, that, well, unlike a lot of standards, the first couple of sections are purpose and definitions and such, but I just wanted to kind of touch on a little bit about what the standards themselves include. Uh, so we are first and foremost, of section 300, it's about cabinet exterior, cabinet interiors of food contact surfaces specifically in their components, uh, and then about the non-food contact surfaces, water supply and water protection that could be for water machine and that could also be for a beverage machine that could be for different types of machine depending on exactly what, the, what it produces and how it does so temperature requirements and control so automatic shutoffs are discussed in section 700 uh, safety and miscellaneous requirements this might be about uh, does it follow ul 541 as far as stability of the machine uh, glass impact if it's a glass facing um, uh, into the um, cavity of the of the machine, depending on you know, what serving any type of food, uh, and then the last section is specific about the water vending machines. Next, and then so just some of the highlights again, some of the things that they act we kind of covered in those areas. Uh, obviously, in three hundred about the cleanability, durability, corrosion resistant, pest proofing, uh, making sure it's on the lay, you know, it's up off the ground. Um, and then uh, 400, more about, as we talked about, more about the um, uh, interior 
uh, make sure it's accessed for cleaning, that you take pieces apart, uh, the CIP program for food contact surfaces, uh, that's even got covered in section 403 about how, how that has to have a, um, a challenge testing, micro testing for E. coli is making sure that it uh, properly cleans uh, and properly sanitizes the uh, internal surfaces if they cannot be taken apart. Uh, that can be sometimes challenging and getting folks to do that as well. And then, of course, like I said, you read here, excess for cleaning, smooth, cleanable dispensers and cups, um, that per water supply, protection tubing material, um, temperature controls in 700. Obviously, that's probably the, uh, the highest risk items that we look at for that and the automatic shutoff controls uh, for safety pro health protocols, uh, performance testing, making sure that the machine does, uh, in fact, able to handle usual perishable foods. Uh, that can be sometimes of a challenge. Um, and then and sometimes machines weren't originally made for perishable foods, but they're trying to use them for that. Uh, keeping records on submitting on these, on the data on those te tests and about the thermometers themselves, the, you know, the, it is an NIST listed, is it uh, suitable for the environment that we're talking about? And then safety, uh, like you said, glass impact, I mentioned earlier, machine stability, uh, electrical components, making sure we look at electric safety as well. Um, and then machine design for water, plumbing, control, sewer, and again, all about those lovely water machines, be it a, a simple dispenser or one that actually does some type of purification process or adds back in for alkaline purposes or whatever the case may be. Next. Some of the ones I've seen and or we've come across in our world for Dama, uh, robotic co coffee baristas, kiosks, and drive -thru. Uh, I'll have a picture of that in a minute. A robotic cotton candy machine. It's kind of funny. I had one back in uh, June that I reviewed and, and ended up approving. And then last week alone, I had four inquiries about doing cotton candy machines. Go figure. That's the hot pro product, I guess. Uh, robotic salad server. Some of those are familiar with Sally. Uh, more recently, Dash to Go, uh, which may down to be the pump. But uh, dash to go, there were some of those processes in place to uh, actually produce a salad, a robotic pizza servers. Um, and, and I say server because it's typically not preparing the pizza, it's more heating, reheating it up within the box. Uh, so it's never touched by any of the machine and typically. Uh, so it's a very interesting process. Uh, Undetected cold display, that's what you're going to see more with your under, your unintended or micro markets, the term kind of fading a little bit, but still kind of gives you a visual as far as having a variety of machines and, and different offerings within the um, uh, within that world. So that, that's hot and heavy still, so seeing a lot of that. And again, very important about being perishable foods, uh, being able to uh, hold that. And then water purifier and, and bottle sanitizer was one that uh, actually my predecessor did uh, that from Italy. Uh, that actually can also do the, you know, treat the, the provide a container, treat it, and then uh, be able to do that too if you reuse the machine. So we'll show you some of those now. Uh, next. So some of you might have seen Cafe X. This is one of the machines that is the coffee barista kiosk. Uh, this is something, actually, I took these photos, a recent trip out to Northern California uh, to do some other work. And uh, this was at the San Francisco airport, uh, I think it was Terminal 3, Gate 4. So I took a couple of, you see my uh, iced hot, iced coffee, uh, iced hot chocolate there uh, that uh, it produced, it's actually very tasty. Uh, but yes, they're making sure that those, those were, you know, look at it to be mobile, the glass or protection or plexiglass. Uh, the one on the right is actually something a little more recent. This was an invent endeavor that, uh, that was started about four years ago. Uh, and it uh, recently, I, I, after I started on board, I took over with my predecessor, had the opportunity that started like what they see there in the left with a basically a freight car and basically make, kind of created what you see on the on the left hand side as far as the you know, robotic barista, but in the size of a freight car. Uh, and then on the right, a rendering of what that'll look like as they put it in. It should be being uh, I believe installed pretty soon up in Wisconsin, um, Milwaukee. Uh, so uh, very innovative, very cool to see 
basically I'm able to see the kiosk up close and personal. Um, all the bells and whistles included there is quite fascinating. Next, next please. Thank you. Uh, the aforementioned cotton candy machine. Uh, this is one that uh, is been utilized or approved and actually being reproduced. They uh, we kind of went through the bells and whistles of making sure and bringing it up to to code here in the states, and then as they produce them further in China, they will be meeting these sta our standards, the standards that we established for that machine. I mentioned the uh, kiosk or the. Uh, uh, you might be more familiar with Sally, but the newer version dash to go here. Um, like I said, unfortunately, I've heard through, through the news that uh, it didn't look like they're going to continue to do this, but this was just recently approved since I've been aboard on um, with NAMA. And then on the right is actually, uh, I think it's Labret Express, um, basically heating up a variety of foods, variety of bakery, uh, could be meat filled. You can kind of see the re refrigeration in the background there. Uh, I've seen it once. I actually haven't had a chance to re-review it yet, but or recertify it yet. But I have seen it at the show, uh, NAMA show earlier this year. Quite fascinating. Very good products. Uh, obviously, very proprietary what they do as far as the food they put into it. Uh, next, please. And then a couple of other ones I mentioned, Blue Pure being the one from Italy uh, that has, like I said, a variety of water choices uh, that you can do, including sparkling, as well as uh, a possibility of getting a container, uh, the bottle, and or cleaning sanit or sanitizing the bottle as well within uh, to the right lower right hand corner there. Uh, the one on for unintended uh, cold holding. This is a fascinating machine. Uh, it looks a little different than what you see here because I did have to get them off up ground. They originally uh, didn't want to go mobile. It's like 750 pounds. Uh, so you're not pushing that puppy around and uh, very much in a higher, more high-end uh, uh, establishments and facilities. This machine actually has UV light as well to do sanit periodic sanitizing for surface sanitizing as it goes, other than having the processes in place for uh, to actually manually clean as well. So, uh, like I said, with all the different POS, POS systems and controls that everyone has in place now, it's fascinating how well they can monitor the technology and bending. Even in my days, my most recent days, and uh, with HelloFresh and and some of the technology we had for manufacturing, it just it's quite amazing what you see coming out of our box. Uh, next, please. Some of the challenges, some of the ones that, as I review different variety of uh, machines and people keep coming to you and thinking, oh, this is going to be easy peasy, just get through the process. Uh, so making sure, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the refrigeration rated for perishable foods. I actually had a I had a uh, applicant that went through the whole process, it, it checked our balances, but unfortunately they had been reviewed uh, by another entity uh, generally for refrigeration, and it said it conformed for, with that SF7, but it did not necessarily, but it was only for non-perishable food. So, you know, I had quite, quite a learning for me as far as working with NSF and, and, uh, and the different groups to make sure what exactly that process needs to go. And unfortunately, they need to go back and get it recertified through uh, ETL, through Intertech, uh, to make sure that it, it does meet the requirements um, for perishable foods. 24-hour performance test requirements. Uh, this is one that a lot of the field testing that we require, a lot of the things like that you can do and check and the auto shutoff controls are in place. Uh, sometimes the 24-hour test, people kind of, it's hard to do, uh, maintain the temperature of basically 100 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours at 25%, around 25% humidity. Uh, that's in both standards in NAMA and as well as uh, NSF. So that one, finding places that actually do that or certified to do that has been actually a, a list I've been collecting to help folks out in that. Procedures and infield testing, as I mentioned, making sure people understand uh, that when you're out there inspecting any inspectors, you think they need to be able to see that the function of that uh, auto shutoff control is in place. Uh, robotic arms, I mentioned earlier, see them handling quite a few different things. 
the biggest thing I find there is making sure the robotic arm is made for handling food. And that's not only the materials, but she's fairly consistent uh, doing some type of uh, plastic or metal that it'll that is food grade, but making sure the screws, the bolts, the things that hold it together indoor the base is it's cleanable. Uh, not not a uh, you know some, something with hard areas to uh, to uh, clean. Uh, machines off the floor I mentioned or mobile that gets some people from the standpoint or making sure you have kickoff plates and you be able to get under the machine and clean it. Uh, that again simple for us. We're all used to that. I've known that for you know 30 to 5 those years. But that even the machines uh, it's, it's, that's a tough one for some folks. It's made some some have had to make some drastic changes. And then cleaning instructions. A lot of the folks, especially when it's coming from uh, overseas, a lot of cleaning is white with cloth uh, for anything, you know, regardless if it's a basic closed package pro program or if it's more of a overall, uh, you know, something with food contact. It's very interesting the education that they get as far as really need to have this process in place to clean, possibly rinse and sanitize as well, depending on what exactly we're doing. Um, one of the things I do want to mention at this point in time from the standards for this uh, thing, NAMA and NSF are actually combining their standards, our standards together. Uh, they're actually going through that process right now with NAMA or with NSF. I was just on a call today talking about some of the changes, um, making sure that we'll be used off one standard that is ANSI approved. Uh, probably towards the end of the year, we'll see how that works, but the Hopefully by the end of the year, we will all be working off the same standards. So regardless of who you contact, you'll be listening to the same stories, <laughs> basically as it were. Otherwise, uh, there's lots of different machines out there. There's a new uh, you know, restaurant, wants to do ramen. Um, there's all kinds of machines I've been seeing out there that already exist or are coming into play. So hopefully uh, as you see them, they'll have gone through the process with NSF or with NAMA and they'll meet, you know, make sure you don't hesitate to ask questions of them or us. Next. Other than that, here's my contact information for my emails. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Hopefully it didn't go too long. Uh, if you have questions, I'm sure we'll cover those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate that. I do have a question here in chat I think we'll take right away. Sure. Um, there are robotic arm boba machines at University of Las Vegas. Um, what are the biggest found violations historically so far with these machines? Cleaning, sanitizing, cross-contamination, or simply cold hot holding units, et cetera, or something else? Interesting. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not going to just defer to defer, but I think that's right down uh, probably part of Canada's uh, operation. I can't say I've seen too many audits or inspections from, from those. Uh, I would imagine for the robotic arms, it would be construction or, or durability, as well as be able to clean some of the things I mentioned about, uh, be able to clean about that. But uh, like I said, I, I hate to say, but I'll have to defer to Kansas on that one. Okay. And I think that uh, fits in with the second question that came in. So. We'll go ahead and, and uh, give the floor to Candace. Uh, Catherine will get your presentation loaded up and you should be ready to go. Thank you. And that is a great segue into my presentation because I am um, definitely going to be talking about what we do have here in Las Vegas and some of the considerations <laughs> for inspecting. Let's see. All right. So what we're really, uh oh, I have a delay on my keyboard. Let me, okay. What we're really talking about is unmanned operations. So that can be in the olden days, we really saw this with assembly lines, manufacturing plants, and now we're seeing the robotic bartenders and baristas. Of course, the vending machines and kiosks like Brian talked about, packaged food is the most simple, but now we're seeing more and more open food operations. Uh, even things that cook and reheat food. So it's becoming more complicated because regulations really aren't written for this type of operation. So in Las Vegas, what we have is um, we have a guy named Tipsy. Tip, all of these machines seem to have cute names. So this is Tipsy and the customer would come into this dining area and order their drink on the tablet. 
And then Tipsy will go ahead and make that drink. And there's Tipsy. And so the, the bottles of liquor hang, excuse me, upside down. And due to computer programming and whatever's on the tablet, the machine knows what ingredients to put in the shaker cup and then it will pour the drink into that cup. So when we talk about common violations, there aren't very many because these things don't make a mess, they're programmed well. And so we really don't see many violations on things like this. Just waiting for my, okay. This is the one at UNLV, the Boba Robo. And as you can see inside, most of that equipment, all of that equipment is NSF. The only thing that was strange for us was the robotic arm and the fact that nobody is actually monitoring this operation. Um, now for this operation, because they do use BOBA and that's a TCS item, we did make, make it to where there was somebody on site, an actual person, but they don't work inside this kiosk, but they check on the kiosk every so many hours. So they're not far away. That's the control that we decided that we needed for that. Okay, and this is the Sally Salad uh, vending machine. And so this is a close-up picture on the right-hand side that shows you how the ingredients, um, the little knob turns at the bottom, lets out so much salad, uh, depending on what you order. And um, we had a little issue with this type of vending machine because we just wanted to make sure that there was going to be somebody who was going to be able to clean those parts and pieces at a frequency that was required. So every four hours, this did okay in one of our EDRs, employee dining rooms in a casino. I don't know if they still have it, but under that type of system, we have the executive chefs, the stewards, and people who are actually on site who can take care of the machine. It's different when you have it to where somebody just plops a machine down and you don't know when they're gonna be back to clean those pieces and parts. All right. It's really a lag on my changing of the slides here. Okay. So really what are the benefits of these machines? Why would anybody use these? It, it looks cute, but what's the point? They're looking for lower overall costs. That's one of the things they wanna be able to expand their business in different ways, put these machines in more locations. Now it changed one second. Okay, here we go. It's also um, supposed to be more convenient. You don't have to hire as many people. The robot doesn't call out sick. Um, product consistency. So we're talking, you can set a recipe and it makes that same iced cocoa every time. And, um, and so, and food safety is another consideration. The robot doesn't have real hands. So is it really bare hand contact? No, it isn't. So there are different inspection considerations like that. There are built-in safeguards that Brian kind of mentioned about automatic shutoffs for temperature, um, waste containers being full, the machine will shut off, cleaning frequency, things like that. So in that way, it is useful and it can really do a great job. The next slide that is pending here is uh, read a robot. So I went out to eat, I went to Chili's and a robot came down the aisle way it freaked me out a little bit because it was very strange. But Rita Robot, you'll see a picture in just a moment. She will take you to your table. She will bring out your food. She will come to your table and sing happy birthday. So this is the type of stuff. And, and of course, the kids all liked when Rita sang happy birthday. But I asked the manager there, you know, what are the benefits? Do you like this robot? It looks like the staff were annoyed because the robot walked really slow and they had to follow it, there it is. And, um, and so as you can see, it can act as a food runner and all of that. The manager did say this didn't quite work out for them. There's a big cost to this machine. Um, I believe it was $60,000 a year. So it's almost like you're renting it and the benefit just didn't outweigh the cost factor for them. So they are, they're not uh, gonna have Rita anymore. What they are going to do, he said, is invest that money into kitchen equipment, such as clamshells and different things like that. So more robotics in the kitchen. 
and we'll see an example of that as well. Just waiting for my slide to change. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is what are some of the cons of robotic equipment? Well, the first con that people usually think of is um, it's taking people's jobs. Why would you have robots taking over all of our jobs? Again, like I said, the cost. Rita is $5,000 a month. And there's another one, Flippy, that I'll show you in a minute. He's $30,000 plus $1,500 a month for just using the software. So there's a great cost for that. Also, as we all know, the more computer gadgets you have, the bigger the cost for maintenance. And then you have to figure out who can actually maintain that equipment, who's, who specializes in that. So your options may be limited there. Also, the, the idea that robots are faster. I don't really think that the boba robot can make faster boba drinks than a human. You know, if you see the example of Starbucks and how fast those guys move, if you had robots doing it instead, I'm not convinced they'd do it faster, but they would give you the same recipe every time. Also, if a customer wants to customize something, are they really gonna get the level of customization that they would get from a human? Um, you can customize things from a robot, but it's not really the same. And of course you don't get the, the same level of customer service. So those are some of the downsides of robots. The next thing here is going to be Flippy. This is the $30,000 fry guy. So what are some of the cons of Flippy? He looks really cool, but, and he can make lots of onion rings. However, um, he is maybe taking the job of a couple people, but also you might have less um, safety incidents with burns, um, things like that. So the business just has to decide, is it worth the money for them to do this sort of thing? See. All right, so food safety considerations. They're really the same as any other food facility. We're talking hand washing. So yes, the robot doesn't have hands, but who's refilling that food? There's a person that's gonna come refill those items and are they washing their hands when nobody's looking? Where are they washing their hands? If there are parts and pieces like the Sally robot or a vending machine, where are they able to wash those dishes? If it's in the middle of a hotel lobby, where's the three compartment sink? These are all things that we have to think about. Uh, of course, Fat Tom, we have to worry about temperature, um, controlling the, the bacteria, the cleaning, cross-contamination. If nobody's around, who's checking on the inside to make sure there's no pests getting in? Like Brian said, if a bad guy comes by and breaks the glass, will that get into your food? So the glass has to meet certain standards. Where does the waste go if, it's, if this is a machine that does self-cleaning? Uh, is that waistline tied into a grease interceptor, et cetera? Or is there offsite storage? That's another one. So if they're storing the food on level four of the hotel, the machine's on level one, do we even know that level four needs a health permit for that storage closet? These are all considerations. Just waiting for that slide to change. So like Brian already mentioned, there are some safety controls. So the machine can cut off when the temperature is greater than 45 for more than five minutes. Uh, for hot style, hot holding equipment, it will shut off if it's um, less than 140 for, greater, for more than five minutes. And for frozen food, if it's greater than 10 degrees for more than 15 minutes, it'll shut off. So there's a lot of controls there. Um, as far as materials, Brian touched on that one as well, but I wanted to, relate that to the zones. So we're talking food zone, splash zone, non-food contact zone. So of course the material is gonna vary on what we would allow or what NSF or NAMA allows depending on what zone we're talking about. All right, so I have an example here. This is another liquor, kind of like tipsy liquor robot. And so I just kind of marked up what I would consider the non-food zone, the splash zone, and the food zone. So of course the cup is gonna be the food contact. The splash is kind of like the robotic hand because the hand and the whatever gadget that is, it doesn't touch the food, but it would get splashed and dripped back down. And then the non-food zone. So what you see with the screws and the joints and everything like that is all gonna be based on what those zones are. This next one is, I believe this is my, okay, the bakery. Uh, 
Libret, I think this one is called. We do have this here in Vegas. This is very simple because um, the food may be TCS, but there's no food contact surfaces. So that makes it very nice. The little boxes that you see inside there get shuffled into like a toaster oven or like a microwave. And then the box gets passed right back out to the customer. This next one, okay, Burger Robo. This one's on the East Coast, I believe, the tri-state area. And it's the most interesting. I haven't, I was not able to get spec sheets for this one. Um, basically, this guy cooks your burger from raw. And so that was quite interesting to me. It does a self-cleaning. They advertise this as a plug and play. So it's all self-contained. You just plug it into an electrical outlet. It toasts your bun, squirts your condiments, keeps it under refrigeration, has a self-cleaning, like I said. And so we have not seen this one here in Vegas, but I'm pretty sure it will be coming soon. I would be most interested in finding out where those waste tanks are and how that is kept separate from the, the actual food operation. Uh, regarding plan review, so what we basically do for any of these is we're just gonna verify that sanitation certification. Uh, we're going to, like I've been talking about throughout the presentation, assess the risk to, to just determine, we kind of make it up as we go in a way. I hate to say that, but um, we wanna know that the support services are conveniently located. Don't tell me that your commissary where you store food or where your three compartment sink is, is 10 miles up the road because that person is probably that operator that we never really see is probably gonna not wanna wash those dishes over there. They're probably gonna take it to the bathroom. We also need that PIC to be knowledgeable. So we check that out during plan review. Let's see here. The next one is regarding inspections. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The next one is inspections. This one is just showing you that um, we're looking for the standards. For, it either has to say NAMA or it has to be certified to NSF standard 25. Of course, these standards pretty much come out of the Conference for Food Protection. So they are science-based, just like the food code. Inspection. So the biggest thing here is with vending machines, we used to be able to do them without calling the operator over. If it was just a simple ice cream vending machine, you can push star pound and some kind of mixture of keys and you would see the temperature. And you weren't too worried because it's just ice cream, packaged ice cream. But now we really need to schedule those inspections with the operator so they can gain access to the machine, open all the food compartments that we need to see, and make sure everything's okay. Make sure it's being maintained clean, that there are no pests. Of course, we can um, check for signs of spoilage, expiration dates, et cetera. We wanna be able to also check out the backflow since a lot of these may be self-cleaning and the waste containers, making sure that all that stuff is separate from where you have your open food handling. And then of course, if it's cooking a, a burger, I would ask that operator to test a burger for me so I can get a cook temperature because when else is it gonna be tested? Um, who knows? So what is the future of robotics? I have no idea, but I saw a couple things online that I thought were very interesting. This is Moly. Remember everybody has a name. And so Moly is one that you can buy for your house. It's only $350,000. And so I'm sure everyone can afford that. But the only problem with moly is you have to still prep all of your ingredients and put them in nice cute containers so that moly will recognize what ingredients to pick up to make your pasta dish. So I'm not sure that moly would work for me. Uh, the next one that I have a picture of here is just a, this one seems more realistic. It's a butcher shop type of area where they have many machines lined up and so each machine would be like chicken, beef, pork, et cetera. And so the customer can just walk up and they can operate this sort of thing 24 hours um, and continuously sell their meat, which seems like a nice idea, easy to control. Each, each meat package has a barcode and everything. So it's kind of, it's very cool. Uh-oh. This next one, and this is the last slide that I'll share here, and then I can take some questions. I came across this, and I don't know if this is real, but 
it seemed real. Pizza HQ says opens to the public with plans to, plans to deliver 1500 robot powered pizzas per day. Yeah, so this hurts my feelings a little bit because of course most people who are gonna work these pizza stands are gonna be teenagers, but that's besides the point. Um, I haven't seen this in Vegas. I don't know if this is really gonna come our way, but this is the idea. And so robotics, this is just only the beginning it seems. And that is the end for me. There's my contact information and also Brian's. And so I'll take questions. We'll leave this up. If you have any additional questions or things you want to discuss, I'm happy to take emails. And right now I can take questions. Thank you, Candace. Um, I do have one here that I, I would like you to respond to. And it's, do you have to change your state food safety regulations? to allow for unmanned TCS vending machines? And do you issue a permit for the machine or does a vending machine need to be under an existing food establishment permit in your state? Good question. So we, the Bobo robot uh, permit was interesting because we don't call that, a, we don't permit it as a vending machine. We permit it as like a portable unit kiosk. And, um, and like I said, for that one, we made sure that there was a papa, this wedding entrance might be for you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Candace. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. And um, so let me see. What was the second half of the question? Uh, about the permitting aspect, whether the machine itself was permitted or does it fall under an existing establishment permit? So typically the machine, it can be both. The machine can be permitted by itself, um, but usually we, you know, we're gonna trace back and see where is the food stored. And then that storage area would also need a permit. Sometimes there's a restaurant and it has a vending machine outside of the restaurant or down the hall or something like that, or within the same casino. And so that restaurant would already have a permit and the vending machine would need its own permit. Okay, we've got time for like one more question here. Um, do you guys have a separate inspection form for these type of establishments? And if so, can you can you share that? We do not have a special inspection form. We use our normal food uh, checklist. We use the normal food regulations. And so, like I say, this is kind of new. And so it's been working out so far just to use a normal food establishment form um, regarding the person in charge and the knowledge. They're not gonna be on site. And so, like I said, we schedule the inspection and we expect that operator, whoever's gonna handle that food when they restock, that's the person that is the person in charge. And so that's how we handle that. Okay, thank you, Candace. There's like 16 new messages that have come into chat. I'm sure there's gonna be multiple questions. Just as a reminder, we are tracking all these questions and we will be giving them to Brian and, and Candace to respond to. And at some point they are gonna be available on the Nature Pathable site. And my understanding is they remain there for, for a calendar year after the seminar is over. So we hope we'll get your, your responses to you. Uh, please join me in thanking Brian and Candace for such a great presentation. And we appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you. Thank you all. Next up is uh, retail food professionals and the public are seeing a great increase in the availability of cultural and ethnic foods across the country. Many of us struggle with how, how these foods are stored, prepared, what the risks are, and so on. Uh, our next pres presenters have created an EHS training package that's available and designed to increase cultural competence and help establish confidence and awareness when, we, when uh, sanita uh, sanitarians and environmental health professionals perform inspections in ethically, ethnically diverse locales in order to ensure compliance and promote food safety. So here today to present on the Ethnic Food Safety Training Toolkit is Joe Rhodes and Joanne Chong Mercado. 
So we'll start with Joe. Uh, Joe is with Marion County Public Health Department. Joe has worked in the public health field with Oklahoma State University Extension Services. He's also with the uh, previously with the Indiana Department of Health and Marion County Public Health Department for a combined total of over 20 years. She holds a master's of science degree from the University of Indianapolis. Joe currently supervises the education and outreach team of the Food and Consumer Safety Department in Indianapolis. She enjoys family time, all animals, and most things outdoor. Joanne Chung is also with Marion County Public Health Department. Joanne's been with the County Public Health Department since May of 2011. Joanne started in mosquito control as a seasonal technician and joined Food and Consumer Safety in September of 2011. Joanne has a Bachelor of Science in Public Health from Indiana University and as an AS in Hospitality from Ivy Tech Community College. Joanne is actively involved in the Indiana Environmental Health Association. She lives in Indianapolis with her husband, Ryan, three kids, ages four, three, and nine months and her two cats. In her free time, she enjoys live trivia, trivia, going to the park with her kids and trying new foods. Again, thank you both for joining us today. And we'll go ahead and start with you, Joe. You have control. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and I think, Joanne, you're gonna forward the slides for us. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yes, I will be forwarding the slides. Okay, next slide, please. The Marion County Public Health Department is located in uh, the center of Indiana. Um, Indianapolis is a major city, and we have a population of about 869,000 in Marion County. Next slide, Joanne. The Marion County Health Department's a subdivision of Health and Hospital Corporation, and the health department is divided into two different, different bureaus. We have a Bureau of Population Health and the Bureau of Environmental Health. The Bureau of Population Health mainly handles the clinical services. The Bureau of Environmental Health is divided up into different departments, including housing, water quality hazards, material management, food safety. So with this division, um, you can see that our environmental health specialists are, gen are not generalists, they're specialists. We have about 16 district inspectors that handle the entire county. Next slide, Joanne. We license nearly 5,000 facilities in Marion County food service establishments. The restaurants and grocery stores make up the bulk of the um, licenses, but our mobiles are really fast growing. Um, we had about um, 262 mobile food units in 2019, and currently for 2022, we have 422 mobile food units. So with the, um, we noticed that with the pandemic, a lot more people were getting into mobile food unit food establishments uh, where they could still provide service because it was um, they didn't have the indoor dining that we had restrictions on with public health orders in Marion County. So we've just really seen that boom in Marion County. Um, we also address illegal and non-licensed public food providers, and that's been growing over the past several years also, the number of those that we received complaints for. Next slide, Joanne. <clears throat> so um, we are seeing min more and more international food establishments in Marion County, and that's with mobiles, temporary events, grocery markets, restaurants, um, our temp events, we have uh, festivals and temporary events that include Gaelic, Pan-Asian, Haitian, German, African, Irish, just to name a few. 
Our mobile food units that have um, international or ethnic foods include Haitian, Thai, Venezuelan, Salvadoran, Honduran, J Jamaican, and Filipino. Um, there are two refugee resettlement locations in Indiana. Uh, one of them is in Indianapolis, Marion County. And over the past 10 years, we've seen 10,000 refugees settle in Indiana. Um, that and they represent 56 countries of origin. The countries of origin with the highest number of refugees resettling in Indiana are Burma and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Next slide, Joanne. So if you have the chat feature, I would we would like for you to take a minute to put into chat some of the different international or ethnic establishments you've seen in your jurisdictions. If you could do that real quick, that would be great. African, Greek, Cambodian, Korean, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Brazilian, Japanese, there's a lot here, um, Peruvian, Vietnamese, Thai, Okay, Halal, Indian, Colombian, Persian. There are a lot of Native American, Arabic, Venezuelan. Okay, so you guys are seeing what we're seeing. That's interesting to that you know that that's a common thing that we're seeing in our jurisdictions. Ethiopian, Afghanistan, Salvadoran, Peruvian, Thai. All right, Guatemalan. And then there's someone has included a comment about the population speaking regular Spanish, but a lot of people that speak native Guatemalan also. That kind of leads into my next question for you is what are some of the challenges that you face in your jurisdictions with this diverse population? So having these international and ethnic um, food establishments in your areas, what are some of the challenges that you face? I'm seeing language barriers, communication, um, food out of temp. Uh, let's see, uh, handouts not translated, thawing practices, tra traditional practices, yeah. Different food safety standards, not knowing the code. Okay, so those are a lot of the things that we're seeing as well. <clears throat> um, we're seeing establishment, communication is our major one, um, and trying to find educational materials that um, are in languages that can be easily understood by the food handlers can be a big challenge. And we're really trying to work on that at our, in our jurisdiction as well. Um, knowledge of the licensing requirements is something that we're, running into. I see refrigeration differences, cleanliness of the kitchens, um, and then uh, food operations popping up in residential zoning. We have that as well. Home style refrigerators, fear of the government. So that one is um, one that we struggle with too. Yeah, it's, and non-NSF approved equipment. So those are definitely all issues that we face also. Um, the them not understanding the co what our code is or the licensing requirements or you know what the regulations are. Um, someone has got down um, acceptance of vermin and willingness to comply with the requirements. Um, we also have the challenge of our environmental health specialists having a not having an understanding of what some of the special processes are or equipment or not even being familiar with some of the food types that these different um, international or ethnic restaurants and markets use um, and being unfamiliar with some of the practices. So all of these things are things that um, we tried to address. It's what really prompted the development of this ethnic um, food safety toolkit. Um, there are some different resources that are out there that can be accessed to help an environmental health specialist when they're doing a food inspection to 
excuse me, to identify a food or possible practices that go along with preparing a food. But we really wanted something that could be used by the environmental health specialists proactively. So before they go out and are in the situation, we wanted them to have some background education that they could use to when they know they're going to an establishment to help them prepare for what they might see and get a better understanding of it. And so that that is what our goal was with the Ethnic Food Safety Toolkit. So I want um, to let Joanne tell you more about the toolkit because she did most of the work on it. And it's really got a lot of special features that she'll describe more for you. And the really great thing about it is that it is, um, it's a living tool. So we can make changes and additions at any time to it based on a new, um, a new country of origin, people who are coming into our area um, based on new equipment that we, new to us, that we come across, new practices, things like that. And so we just try and put in it as much useful, applicable information that we can, but also in a very easy to follow, easy to access way. So, um, and I did notice that someone put in here cultural sensitivity. And I'm glad that somebody mentioned that because that's very important. And I think that that's part of what the toolkit does also. The more our staff understand what they're gonna see and some of the things that are taboo or um, practices, it helps them, I think, to um, not have that fear of the unknown that a lot of times leads to an insensitivity. So I think that it helps address it, but. We're also looking at sense of cultural sensitivity training um, to help with that also. So Joanne, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you tell everyone more about our toolkit. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. So now we're going to show you what we use to train our new staff or to use as refresher training. This is, this is what we use. So I wanna start off with the benefits of the toolkit. <clears throat> it introduces different types of foods. So in the chat, you mentioned different types of ethnic cuisines that you have in your jurisdiction. We have the same you know, types of populations. <clears throat> I also include visual aids. It allows the EHS to have a self-study at their own pace. So as a new inspector, you know, a new sanitarian, you know, if, if you weren't exposed or have a lot of experience with different types of cuisines, then this allows you to go at your own pace. This isn't like an online training session where you have to do it within so many hours. This is at your own pace. And you could always go back and reference for refresher. <clears throat> you also have information sharing. So the really nice thing about the information sharing is that it's broadly shared. So we've got senior staff you know, seasoned staff that's been there a long time that they've retained information that they can share to the new staff. But sometimes it's really hard to remember, oh, well, this happens at this place or this is a, a common thing. And so being able to use those pieces of information to this toolkit, it helps broaden that information and it's more common knowledge. It's not, I saw it one time and now I've got lots of questions. And then you go ask your supervisor or your coworker, and you're not finding out after the fact, you're finding out beforehand. I also include examples of field documentation. So the benefit of this is that if you've never seen an SOP in the field, or you haven't seen unapproved equipment, then we've got pictures in here so that you're more familiar with it. Instead of being in the field, seeing it for the first time and questioning, is this okay? Or, you know, what information is missing on this SOP? Um, all of that is built in here. So how to use this toolkit? So we're gonna be coming up on that slide soon. Each cuisine is gonna list different types of foods. So I've kind of organized it by country 
of the origin of where the cuisine has come from. And then each food has a link to additional information. So the main homepage is what I've called the table of contents. It's linked to each of those ethnic food slides. And, we'll, and I'll show that to you in a minute. The pictures, the visual aids that I talked about are just pictures linked to a YouTube video. And the really nice thing about this is that I picked videos that as a new inspector or a refresher training, it just gives you the quick information, the basics of what types of foods, what the normal practice is and what the ingredients are. And you can also hear what, you can also see what these ingredients are and hear what the words are for these types of foods. So the videos are less than seven minutes because you've got a lot of information you're going through. Just give me what I need to know. So that way in practice, you have the general idea, but when you're out in the field, Oh, I recognize that food. Oh, I remember this. This is what they, this is what they're intending to do with it. So it helps, you know, visually see it and you can help remember it. I also have a pronunciation of the word. So when we talk about cultural sensitivity, we're saying a word that is correct instead of, you know, possibly offending someone or saying it wrong and they don't know what you're talking about. So that's really important so that you're on the same level and that you know what their food is and that you know the background. And I think that kind of helps with being the comfort level. You know, if they do have a fear of the inspector or they just think that you don't know what their food is, they might be a little bit standoffish. This I think helps. There's also additional resources for cultural food safety resources that are linked at the very end for more information and it's peer reviewed articles. It's got some case studies in there and just really helpful information to just, if the EHS needs more information, it's there for you. So I wanna bring this up really quick that if you did not know about this, I wanted to share another resource. It is an app developed by the Center of Agricultural and Food Security and Preparedness. It's a really nice nifty app to use because you can use it in the field. So the big difference between the toolkit and the app is that the toolkit is meant to be used in preparation and in the office. Whereas the app, if you got a question, you can pull out your phone and look it up really quick and read it and then make your decisions. Is this gonna make someone sick based on the information on the app? Um, if you don't have the app or you, would you like to download it, you can go on the Google Play or the Apple Store and you'll want to search cultural food safety app. And this is the icon, so that way you know you've got the right app, and then you can explore a little bit and use it in the field. The, uh, another big difference is that Joe had mentioned that our toolkit is a living, breathing document, so we can constantly make updates, add information, whereas the app, it doesn't have the, the updates. It, it has the information there for you, which you can pull out in the field. Uh, so those are the couple of differences, but it is another additional resource, I'm not discouraging you to not download it because it's another thing that you can use in the field, but uh, it's another tool that you can use. Okay, this is the toolkit piece right here. This is what our inspectors see. So I'm gonna show you how this is used. In traditional PowerPoints, you're gonna go next slide to next slide to next slide. Whereas this, this allows, I've, I've made it so that you can jump around. I've linked all of these slides to other slides. So that way, if you just need a quick information refresher on Japanese cuisine, you can just click on Japanese without having to go clicking through all the slides to find the Japanese slide. So just a couple of neat features I'm gonna walk you through really quick. I hope that you can see my mouse. I'm going to start in African. We can see your pointer, Joanne. You can't see my pointer? We can. Oh, okay. All right. So I've clicked on the African slide. You're going to see pictures. They're going to be labeled in case you don't, you know, don't re easily recognize it. There's going to be the food items here. And there's going to be a mini quiz in special notes. So I'm gonna click on bushmeat really quick. And this is what every slide of every different types of foods that are listed is gonna look like. It's gonna 
a title as what it is, what your main ingredients are, how it is made, what an EHS should look for, and if there's additional resources, it will be listed here. So I said that you're not gonna go to the next slide by clicking um, the arrow or your mouse. There's a little button here to go back to the African slide. So it'll take you back to the main African homepage. The other nice thing about it is that I've made a button here where you can go back to the table of contents. So I'm gonna go back to the table of contents and it takes you right back. So that's a really nice thing is that if you just needed to know, you know, one thing or a couple of things, you can go to that slide or you can go through it as a traditional PowerPoint going through each slide after each slide. <clears throat> self-study, self-paced. Then I'm gonna go to the faith-based. And here you're gonna see the same thing. We've got pictures, you've got your two food items, there's a mini quiz and there's little notes. So I wanna highlight this section here, a special note on equipment. If you have a faith-based facility and let's say that you have a Jewish or a kosher kitchen, and if you hadn't been to do an inspection here, uh, in their religion, they believe that you separate meat and dairy separately. So in their kitchen, you're most likely gonna see two kitchens because they don't wanna cross-contaminate dairy and meat. Another thing that you, want, that you may not know of is your thermometer. That in their kitchen, they're gonna have two thermometers, one for testing the meats, and one for testing the dairy. And if you used one thermometer to, tech, to check both, that's, that is not okay. Uh, so you don't wanna offend you know, someone by you're doing, the, you're doing your job and you're sanitizing your thermometer in between, but in their eyes, it's still cross-contamination. But if you didn't know that, you know, in, in your professionalism and you're doing a food inspection, you might have done, you might have done this and you know it's you were you weren't informed <clears throat> another note here is that a rabbi may want to observe the inspection and as a female they may not shake hands with the female female ehs because they don't believe in you know touching the uh, touching women on their religious beliefs so i'm going to go back to my table of contents and jump right back another thing i'm going to point to you we're going to go to indian and I'm gonna show you the pronunciation. So I'm gonna to go to none and I've got a little microphone and I'm gonna click on the button so you can hear the pronunciation. None. And there we go. So some of the other cuisines or different types of dishes will have, you know, not an, uh, it's just a word that you may not be familiar with or not know how to say properly then this is in here. So that way when you're out doing an inspection and you see non, then you're using the right word and they know, oh, they're talking about non, they're Indian flatbread. But here again, you can see this, the same table set up, what it is, main ingredients, how it's made, and what an EHS should look for. So I'm gonna go back to the Indian slide and I'm gonna go back to the table of contents here. It's got a special note, go back. <clears throat> Another neat thing about it is uh, looking at when I talked about broadening information, sharing the information broadly. So if we go to Chinese and I'm a relatively new inspector and I'm reviewing all of this information, I click on equipment. Here's a real inspection picture taken in the field at a Chinese style establishment. And this is an unapproved utensil. But if I had never seen this before, or I may not have seen it in use, but I've seen it, that they use this for, you know, picking up raw chicken and batters and then trying it. Now I know, and I've seen it. So now when I go out in the field, I know what it is and I know that it's not okay. I'm not questioning, is this okay or not? I already know it's not okay. So I'll go back to my Chinese slide and then I go back to the main home slide and I'm gonna go back to my table of contents. I'm gonna show you an SOP. So we go to the Japanese slide and I have an SOP. Time is a public health control for sushi rice. And here's an SOP. This is a real SOP that we have for one of our establishments. And this is just a picture of what it looks like so that <clears throat> when you're out doing a different 
sushi establishment, you're familiar with what you're looking for, what information is there and maybe what's missing. Now, SOP should already be in place and approved, but as a new inspector, you may be going in for your first time seeing it in the field, this will be really helpful. So you've got a sticker on there and it's labeled. It looks like it's being done right. Okay. Now I wanna show you a video. So I'm gonna to go to the Vietnamese slide. You've seen these pictures. The pictures here show you what the food is. The pictures were also links to the videos. So I mentioned earlier that, excuse me, videos were seven minutes or less. There are different varying types. The videos that have been selected are just regular homemade YouTube videos. So you're gonna see, you know, bare hand contact. You're gonna see things that wouldn't maybe not, not necessarily be approved, but you're gonna see the general practice in the ingredients. And they're seven minutes or less because they're quick. It just gives you the basic information. But here, I'm gonna click on the blue. And I only picked this one because this is like a 30 second video, but just really quick demonstration. Ooh, look at this. Oh my God. Look at that. <laughs> okay. So just really quick and dirty kind of a, this is what this is, what it's about. There's another special note here and other different types of foods associated with it. I'm gonna go back to uh, table of contents and I'm gonna pick Mexican for my last, my last point that I wanted to point out, mini quizzes. So I, I decided to include, or it was suggested to me to include mini quizzes just to kind of help reinforce the information that's being learned. So if you click, click on a quiz, and the quizzes are mini because I may have one or two or three questions. So quick question, does a heat treated or cooked ceviche require consumer advisory? And these are all animated. So, you know, if I was quizzing myself, no, the heat will kill the bacteria, I get the answer. And then if I click forward, then it takes me to the next slide, but otherwise I can just take, click back to the table of contents. And that is how I use or have designed or, you know, made this toolkit so you are able to jump around. I'm gonna show you the additional resources and here are the links. So these are all links to where it's been sourced if, if uh, the EHS needs more information. Let me go back here. The next steps in this toolkit, we add more inspection pictures, add more SOPs. Uh, Joe had mentioned that, you know, we've, we're having more people, uh, refugees in our, in our county. So for example, we're gonna have more Haitians. So we would need to create a slide for Haitian culture. And instead of the videos from YouTube, maybe we try to have more food safety focused videos. Uh, that might be a little bit difficult if we need to make them in-house or if I find videos online that are short and focus, you know, they have food safety focuses and that would be really, that'd probably be the best one. Uh, I have an exercise here, but since this is an online format, um, I don't. I don't think that we can do this as a uh, as a trying it out. And that is the end. I have. I think we've got lots of time to to take questions. And one of the questions was, what program did you use to develop this toolkit? Oh, good question. I used PowerPoint. You didn't if you didn't know, you could use PowerPoint. This is all PowerPoint. You can make links to it. You can add links to, to the pictures, to the videos. You can make links to the, each slide. It's all PowerPoint. There are several people, Joanne and Joe, who are asking where they can obtain this toolkit. <laughs> and I understand that it has been loaded on to the Retail Food Program Standards Resource Center on Food Shield. Is that correct? That is correct. It is loaded there because 
when I try to share it through email, it's just too big. The other thing is that you can only view a copy of it. So on the Food Shield, you can download it and then you can adjust it or customize it to your, to your county, you know, adding your own, um, your own slides. On and the Food Joanne, Shield, yes. Was that placed in standard seven folder? Yes, it was. And there's also a separate group that just has the toolkit. So I can invite you to that group or it's also on standard seven. Okay, thank you for that. When you open that file folder in Food Shield, there's also a little Word doc to help you walk you through the steps of how to add those. So if you're not familiar with how to make links in the PowerPoint, I've got a little small tutorial in there. So that way you can um, do it yourself. Okay, thank you. I see Charles Otto has also added a link into the chat for another additional resource. So make sure you look at the chat before you uh, exit today. And I'm just scanning for any other questions. Everyone seems to be so very excited about what we've seen oh, here. Oh, good. I'm gonna stop sharing. So hopefully you've got my contact here so I can hop back on the, the Zoom here. Yeah, and I see uh, Joe, you, uh, you commented in reply to a question about customizing the toolkit or parts of the toolkit for individual jurisdictions. You want to comment on that? Um, yes, with it being a PowerPoint, it's very easy. And like Joanne said, she has some simple instructions for how to do those links on the different slides. So if a jurisdiction wants to um, download that, they can add their they can add additional foods or they can add other um, ethnic um, and countries of origin, things like that. So if and I see someone said, that we should add, um, I think was it, let me see if I can find it here. There was a suggestion of something we should add on there. Um, but anyway, so obviously we'll take these ideas and we'll look at adding them to our own, but um, anybody can, once they download it, can add their own foods, their own different cuisines, their own different processes, things like that. And Joanne has made that really nice um, instruction sheet to explain how to do those things. I didn't know you could do links like that back and forth to the table of contents and everything until Joanne showed me what she had done with this toolkit. So it's uh, really great that it could be customized and we don't have a problem with other, other jurisdictions making it more customized to their area. I know the author of this statement. It says it would be nice to see some traditional Native American ceremonial foods added in uh, for our for our tribal partners. That's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, someone had asked how long it took to put this together. Joanne, do you, can you give an idea of how, about how long that's taken? Uh. It definitely took me some time. I, I don't remember how long it took. I would guess maybe three or four months. If I worked on it, you know, on a couple of days, and then I went out in the field, it definitely took some time. I forgot to mention that, you know, part of recognizing the gap in our, in our staff, you know, not being comfortable doing the food inspection at an ethnic cuisine, the only training that we had was going to an international grocery store and taking a walk around and looking at the different types of foods. And we still do that, but having this more sit down, you know, um, format, looking at pictures, looking at videos and reading about it, I think really made a difference in confidence and just being more prepared. So I forgot, I wanted to share that. So I don't know if other jurisdictions even have something in place or if you have an international grocery store, that's definitely a good place to start because that way you can, you know, look at the ingredients. If they've got a deli or, you know, a meat shop inside a grocery store, then you can look at those things in the field as a field trip, not as an inspection. As a yeah, again, I'm, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. 
I'm sorry, Brad. As a next step, it would be great if we had it to where when people add into it, everyone could benefit from that. If we had a central one that could just be built more and more to include different things from other areas also. Um, at this time though, it's it's more of a, you know, we've got the base that you've seen here and then you can download it and customize it for yourself. Um, but eventually we would like to have it where we can we can put all that into one where everyone can benefit from other, other jurisdictions input. Okay, I wanna take a moment and I wanna talk about Food Shield for a minute if I can. There's several folks that have asked about Food Shield. Uh, Food Shield is uh, available to all regulatory folks um, that uh, they can speak with their retail food specialists and request to be part of the Retail Food Program Standards Resource Center. It's a sharing site uh, specifically designed for the Retail Food Program Standards, but within there, this Standard 7 folder is where there's a tremendous amount of tools that are created to be helpful uh, to regulatory agencies. And that's where uh, this toolkit has been placed by Joe and Joanne. So to gain access to Food Shield, which is like the umbrella over the resource center group or site, you wanna speak with your retail food specialist and they will get you uh, registered and linked as a member to be able to make, make uh, yourself available to all those tools. Uh, Chelsea posted the link in chat to your retail food specialist if you don't know who that is. Thank you too, Catherine, for doing the same thing. So um, reach out to your specialists uh, here at FDA. We have a procedure to get you registered and get you into the site. Looking on Food Shield, but can't find the, yep. Peter, you have to you have to be within that retail food program standards resource center. Um, you got to be a member to to be able to see uh, the different folders in there. So reach out to your specialist again. I'm really not seeing specific questions other than folks want this toolkit. So I think you're probably going to get some follow-up emails, Joe and Joanne, and uh, we probably will uh, with Food Shield as well. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions. Oh, wait. Have you experienced products that RFEs have that did not come from an approved source. Is this also included on the training toolkit? Can you can you say that again? I don't I don't know if I got it. I think so, Land are asking if we have have anything about unapproved food sources on there. The only I think the only thing I've got is under the African, which is the bush meat. But as far as recognizing unapproved sources, you just really have to ask questions. Uh, I guess it depends on equipment. You know, do they have the capacity to make that food? You know, just like if it wasn't an ethnic food, you would ask your regular questions. Uh, I don't have anything specific for, for an ethnic type for unapproved source? I think that question uh, on some of the tribal ceremonial foods, uh, there's someone who commented on some of the foods from Southwest Alaska, which, which are um, sometimes they go out and, and harvest uh, a deer to uh, teach and train traditional 
uh, hunting methods, uh, how to uh, maintain the meats, cook the meats, et cetera. I think that's where that's coming from. Um, so yeah, it's probably products that may not directly be approved using the food code language. Uh, for that specific type, you know, if someone wanted to take that under, you know, that and add it to the toolkit, we don't have a lot of experience with that type of food. So that's why not everything is on here. Or it's just what we've seen in our county. Okay. But if someone has that kind of experience, that's the beautiful thing about this is that someone could take this and add their own content to it. And then if there's updates, you know, back on Food Shield, you know, we could find what those um, additional slides are and then put it in this master one and then, you know, keep sharing it so that more information keeps getting added because we don't have all those types of different types of uh, cultures or cuisines. Sure. Yeah, I see it, uh, another comment here would like to see tribal ethnic foods added to the toolkit. But here's a question for Joe and Joanne. Can you comment on how your relationship with your retail food establishments has improved as you're implementing this toolkit? What positives have come out of this? Well, I would say, Joanne can speak to this better than I can, but I would say that um, the, there's an appreciation um, it, with us having some knowledge when we go into a food establishment of what the different food types are and the different processes they use and even how to pronounce some foods. Um, I think there's an appreciation that we've put forth an effort there um, to have an understanding of their food establishment and their practices. And so that helps build that early rapport that's so important to us because our primary goal is to form a partnership with the food establishment owners and management and to use education first uh, to help, you know, have that shared goal of providing, you know, safe food to the public. So I think that, that it helps us get started on that right foot with the food establishments when they can see that we've put forth that effort. Joanne, do you have more to, to add to that? I think that I definitely agree with all of that. I think it definitely makes the inspector feel more confident. You know, they're not panicking up here. Oh, no, what do I do? And then they take on a bit of a more, um, maybe a friendlier approach. And so that building that relationship, being comfortable and asking them the right types of questions instead of asking them the basics to kind of figure out how to navigate. Uh, I think it makes the inspector more, much more confident. So they're going in, you know, with already, you know, this is um, with a much more comfortable um, approach, I guess. If, if I didn't know, I might be a little bit more, um, not like, be, I'd be less nervous about it. And so if, if I'm nervous, you know, the person in charge might be nervous. They sense that feeling, you know, I'm not, or not being competent, you know, it's that cultural sensitivity, I think is really important. Sure. Well, I know I'm, I'm looking forward to looking at these materials moving forward. And with that, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, I want everyone to join me in thanking Joe and Joanne for presenting and sharing the Ethnic Food Safety Training Toolkit. I'm sure you'll be receiving many calls and emails for this very valuable information. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. We appreciate it. Yes, thank, thank you, you and you're very welcome. Please send an email. I wasn't able to get all the emails on that chat, <laughs> but yeah, uh, please send an email. Yeah, I think Catherine Del Mundo is uh, recording all the chat. Um, so we could probably get that information to you, Joanne. And with that, it's just me and one other individual here before we uh, close out our Pacific Region breakout session. So I want to introduce again, Ms. Wonderful herself, Catherine Del Mundo.
Uh, Catherine, of course, is one of our branch three retail food specialists located down in our Denver office. And we were very lucky to coax her away from the territory of Guam to join our team. So Catherine is going to close out our session for us. Catherine, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Brad. So like Brad mentioned, that was our last session for today. So I will go ahead and close us off with a few reminders and acknowledgements. So copies of the presentations for our breakout session are, are posted in our Pacific Breakout Pathable page, and it's under the file section next to the chat and poll box. Now for that last presentation, it's also shared in Food Shield, and that may be more updated than the one that we have on Pathable. Um, so we also have our uh, state and territory reports posted on our main Pathable page under the documents download section. Now, for questions that we did not get to answer, we will be compiling them into an FAQ document and we will post it sometime after the seminar under our Pacific Breakout page. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have the second half of our general session happening tomorrow, followed by the risk factor study workshop on Thursday. So we hope that you continue to attend and enjoy the seminar and learn from all the sessions being shared. Now, I'd like to thank uh, take this time to thank all the speakers for really the wonderful presentation, for sharing your knowledge, your valuable experience, and the creative tools and approaches to new items that I'm sure that all those in attendance will really, really benefit from. I'd also like to thank Nacho and Conference Direct, especially Chelsea and Casey, for their assistance with planning and hosting this Pacific Breakout session. So we know we all know that planning something this big takes a lot of time and effort, especially in the back end. So I want to thank you for your patience and dedication to making this session a continued success. Next, I do want to thank all everyone here, all of our attendees. I know that the past couple of years, maybe even longer, it's been very, very challenging. But what really keeps me positive and the rest of us here in FA really positive is seeing all the hard work you do and continue to do in spite of those challenges that you face. We've seen in today's session that the landscape of retail food safety is always evolving, always changing. And it's events like this that I always learn so much from everyone. And hearing your stories of the new things that you see, the challenges that arise from those and how you all work together, share your information, network and collaborate with one another, that really brings joy to my heart and it really encourages me as an individual. So really from the bottom of our hearts, we'd like to say thank you for all that you do and really just give you guys a big, 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 big round of applause. So thank you so much. Finally, I would also like to take this time to give a super, super big shout out to the wonderful, dedicated, esteemed, amazing and awesome FDA team. Chris, Brad, David, Diane, Katie, thank you for all your work, um, not only for this specific breakout session, but for the day-to-day -day activities that you guys do to support our jurisdiction. Really, everyone, this is such an amazing team. Uh, I am super, truly blessed to be a part of it. Now, with that said, it was so great to see and hear everyone virtually. Uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing everyone in person, face-to-face -face, in future seminars. So again, thank you so much. Have a good evening. And for some of you, good morning. Uh, thank you for attending the Pacific Breakout Session. Bye for now. And we really hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. I thought for sure you would say half a day. <laughs> half a day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.